Hello. I've actually gone up a little bit earlier, uh, probably by about a minute or so, so I'm sure it won't bother too many people. Okay, thanks. Welcome to the channel this evening. Uh, got an absolutely fantastic guest who I'm not going to have enough time, I swear, uh, to cover all the things uh, that we want to talk about. So uh, it may be possible I may have a couple of co-hosts joining me as we go on. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Now, um, through uh, my good friend David McGifford, who's done an interview on the channel. Also, you can see it in the industry interviews uh, folder. And another guy that we interviewed called Alan Graff. Uh, the name of uh, Debbie Evans came up uh, a couple of times in conversation. And I had a quick look on IMDb and I almost had a heart attack because this woman has 400 credits on IMDb. I don't even know how that would be possible to get that many in my lifetime, um, unless I was an extra on a thousand movies or something. But uh, she has been working uh, as a stunt woman, uh, also as an actress, uh, as a producer occasionally, uh, in the industry since the late 1970s, right up until um, the present day. Uh, she shows no sign of uh, stopping whatsoever, and that's without sponsorship from Red Bull. So um, I'm going to bring in uh, Debbie Evans in just a second. But uh, guys, just to give you an idea of uh, some of the work that she's uh, done in her career, and the IMDB links are uh, down below the page, uh, but you can have a quick look at this sequence um, from The Matrix. This is um, Debbie on the bike, and we'll get into this in just a second. Um, I can probably put the sound on this. Wow. Now, um, I'm just going to pause that there. There's plenty more to see. Um, but would you just look at those, the speed that that was going at? And there is no CGI there. That's real effects. Uh, and the volume is uh, not really important at this stage. So I'm going to, without any further ado, let me bring in my guest, uh, Debbie Evans. Debbie, thanks so much uh, for coming on the Outcast Creative Industry Interview channel. So pleased that you said yes. My pleasure. Uh, we've already got comments from some of our regulars. That bike sequence is breathtakingly impressive. I mean, we are um, we're going to kind of do a typical interview and kind of go with. Uh, so, how did you get started? But a lot of people will have seen uh, the Matrix um, sequels. Um, I'm I know you've got a background in motorcycle championship racing. Is that what got you the gig for that specific stunt on the Matrix? Were you kind of the, the, the person at the top of the list for that sort of thing to double for? Was it for Carrie? Uh, Carrie Ann her. Moss. Carrie yes. Ann Moss, you doubled yeah. for that, right? Yes, I I was was considered the top stunt woman um, in Hollywood to do any of the motorcycle things for a very very long time. So um, that was quite an experience, and um, it was a great show to work on. Really fun. Was that was that a real person strapped to the back of you, or was that a dummy in that? It was seat? a real person, that not was a not strapped to the back of me. Um, when when it comes off of the car carrier, it's mm. on cables, and right. uh, and then. It, I had to match the speed of the ground because the the truck was actually moving, so that the car or the the motorcycle wouldn't flip. So I had to match it, and then then we set up a ramp, and the normal double that we used for the rest of the thing, uh, we didn't use for the actual jump. Uh, we used a, a guy who was a really good motocross racer, and he was used to jumping and being in the air. We had tried using a dummy in rehearsals with just a very small ramp. It was about the size of a curb, and the, the um, dummy just buried me into the tank. 
So uh, I said, I need, I need a real person on there. And so we got him and he got on the back and we set it all up and it was the actual Ducati. Sometimes we take the motorcycles and we will kind of fake it. We'll put all the, the stuff on the outside and the handlebars and like for police motorcycles and a lot of different motorcycles will actually be using a dirt bike. But this was not a dirt bike at all. This was the real deal. And um, so it's not meant to be jumped, that's for sure. So we jumped it about 12 times. And every time after we jumped it, and the, the ramp was about three and a half feet tall. So it was pretty high. And um, every time we jumped it, we'd get off, jump off the bike right away and look at uh, the the forks and the frame and everything and make sure there were, were no stress cracks or anything. And then we would um, get back on and do it again. What, what kind of speed were you going at in that, in that sequence? Cause well, it looks with, like traffic, with traffic, I was going up to 90 miles an hour and against traffic, I was doing uh, 50 to 55. So, um, we did that with four uh, lanes of traffic and four cars making lane changes, which was pretty, yeah. pretty hairy. And then, then we had um, a pass where we did just the camera bike and the motorcycle. And what we did was we took the little things on the freeway where uh, they mark the lanes when they're working on it. And yeah. so... It was kind of my idea. I said, well, we can take those and we can set it up on the pattern that we each have to go because we each had to go different patterns and um, then, you know, just spray paint different colors. And that's what we did. And so it's kind of the going against traffic is a combination of uh, CGI and real cars. So I always like. I always like to say, um, cause people go, Oh no, that was all CGI. And I go, well then how come I got hit by one? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, damn that. I mean, with, the yeah, if you think about it, you've got 50 miles an hour plus 25 miles an hour. That's a 75 mile yeah. an hour impact. Uh, what happened was one of the guys that, um, was supposed to clear the lane as I was coming up and I was supposed to take his lane. Uh, he didn't move out of the way uh, when he was supposed to. And so I, I started to turn like I was going to go. And then I realized that I would either hit him head on or if I missed him, I would hit the other cars head on. So I straightened up to split the lane and he came over and just grazed me. So I put a pretty good sized dent in the, the fender of that car. Or, and uh, yeah. Were you able to stay on the bike? Um, no, it low sided, which, you know, I kind of tried to gather it up, but it was in a lot of pain. So yeah. I didn't, just ended up laying it down. And uh, I still have a mark on my foot. I didn't break anything, but I still have a mark on my foot from that. Damn. Okay. Well, look, before we, we, there's already a, a, matrix uh story before we um dive back into the beginning of your career i'm just going to ask you some real quick questions uh just just say the first thing that comes into your head just to give us a sense of of uh who debbie evans is in terms of your um creative tastes shall we say could you tell us the first film you saw at the cinema the very first when you were a kid uh mary poppins Mary Poppins, that's a good choice. Uh, I still love Poppins. Spitzbot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was the last film you saw at the cinema? The last film? Yeah. Uh, we went to see Mission Impossible, the last Mission Impossible. I knew, uh, I knew you were going to say that. Were you, were you happy with it? Some I liked good, it. Yeah, some yeah. pretty good stunts in there. And yeah. Tom, li Tom likes to, no CGI face on Tom. He likes to go the whole hog. Uh, yeah, well, there's CGI. Unfortunately, in today's movies, there's usually an element of CGI. Uh, could you name me a favorite film of yours that you watch at least once a year? 
uh, the first Fast and Furious. Ah, very interesting. Which I believe, <laughs> which I believe you worked on. Yes, uh, you cut the film, you know, my demo reel, right at the point where I was going to go underneath the truck and then flip the the car. Oh well, well that well, was all done real. That there was no CGI in that at all. I'll tell you what, we'll 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 show that quickly. So, <laughs> and uh, guys, I know there's no sound on this, but that's quite deliberate, so don't worry about that. So, um, you might as well mute that actually for me. So, uh, that's that's you in that. Yep. Right. Okay. Oh, and uh, and going under here, that's you. Yeah, that was a film called Never Too Young to Die. <laughs> and I was 22. So that was kind of uh, um, unsettling, to say the least. I'm, uh, I'm glad that the title of that film did not turn out to be strangely <laughs> yeah. prophetic. David Macy's asking, how loudly did you swear at that driver when uh, you had that clipping uh, accident? Uh, um, I was and- too hurt to swear. <laughs> yeah, I think that, yeah well, there you go. She was in so much pain, David. Yeah, they took me. They took me to the hospital, and um, my passenger went as well. And I, they, I didn't have anything broken. So what I did was I went back to the hotel that night, and I took my, the trash can and filled it full of ice and water, and I stuck right. my foot in it like five times for as long as I could stand it, uh-huh. and I limped to work the next day and carried on I guess I just yeah I just carried on I just kept going damn that's you got to be made of stern stuff to be a, a you know working the stunts that's 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 what it's all about uh Johnny Strong was in the first Fast and Furious correct is that was he one of the cast I think he was who was in he was in Black Hawk Down as well I'm not sure okay you might you I mean I know you don't work predominantly with the lead cast uh no. final quick question uh do you have a favorite drama television series of all time um well one that i really enjoyed that i worked on was uh beauty and the beast with uh, linda hamilton yeah that was you- that was a lot of fun and and uh you know fun to watch as well we're going to be doing a whole section on uh, how you've doubled because you've doubled for Linda Hamilton about five or six times, I think, and we, we're gonna we're gonna get into that a little bit. So for those guys in the chat, uh, yeah, um, Debbie has uh, worked with Linda many many times. Okay, so a lot of this, if we go back, a lot of this started for you that you were quite into riding bikes at quite a young age. Is that am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, my dad taught me how to ride at six years old. And uh, the first thing I did was it was a mini bike with a 125 engine in it. So it was really powerful. And um, um, I yeah. first thing I did was crash into a pile of uh, rebar and concrete. And of course, then we didn't have any helmets. So he, he told me, he said, well, you better get back on because if you don't, you never will. And so I got back on and, and he said in less than five minutes, I was smiling and laughing and having a good time. But I, I've ridden pretty much my whole life. I don't even remember that incident. Is that, um, that photograph, which is from your website, I've got to ask this, is that one of the bikes from that movie called Megaforce? It looks like it. Uh, death, uh, let's see. Good. Or is that Death Sport? That might be Death, Death Sport. Sport. That's Death Sport. Death Sport from 1980. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's they, the first one I worked on. I think. Yeah. I think Megaforce probably borrowed those bikes. I uh, was. I was 19 years old. <laughs> right. So that is a 19-year-old Debbie, uh, following on from the kind of Christmas present that that Daddy gave you, and uh, putting it to full use in a professional sense. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you know anyone could ask for more. So you you. You entered some competitions and that kind of thing. How did that that world and getting involved in that world, how did that then osmosis go into you then getting involved in stunts? What was your what was your segue into the stunt woman world? How did that come about? Well, I've you know, like I said, I'd ridden my whole life and about every other weekend we would go camping and riding and compete uh, either in the hills doing trials or the desert. Um, doing enduros, which is like desert racing. And so 
all of that stuff, um, I just, that's what I did. And I, I got a factory sponsored ride with Yamaha when I was 15. And uh, then, you know, I was into every sport I could do as a kid. And my dad happened to know his a sponsor who knew a stunt coordinator. And it was my dad's sponsor for Montessa. And can you put the other screen up? Because it throws me off just having me up. I, I absolutely can. Thank you. I think, I think people there, prefer to look. I if think I'm people, not looking at you, then it's harder to I'm talk. I'm still here. I just think people prefer to look and listen to you talk rather than me, <laughs> rather than me nodding a lot like Michael Parkinson. No, this is fine for me anyway. All so, right, okay. No problem. So anyways, um, yeah. So my friend, my, uh, the coordinator who hired me first went over to talk to my dad's sponsor and said, you know, I'm doing this movie. I'm coordinating it and it's all motorcycles and there's not a girl that's in the business who can do what I need. I need a, to her to jump a 30 foot ravine on a motorcycle and do all kinds of riding and jumps and everything like that on those motorcycles. And those motorcycles had about uh, maybe 30, 40 pounds of extra weight because of all the metal stuff that they had on them. And so uh, he, you know, the guy said, hey, just call Debbie. You know, here, here's uh, Dave's number. Just call call her dad. And, and so that hooked me up with that. And I went out and did the rehearsal and it all went great. They loved, I was just the right size for the actress. And um, so, you know, that was my first first job and and it was kind of like stunt school for me because I was on it you know for like uh from September to, to February and and I was working with all these famous stunt people and they would tell me um you know all these things uh, kind of taking me under their wing and teaching me and the more I I would learn the more I would come back with more questions. And so I got really interested in all of it when I, I saw them do fire burns and fights and all these different things. And I thought, you know, gosh, this is what I've been training for my whole life and didn't know it because I was an athlete as well as, as a writer. And that's what got me my start. And because I was able to work with a lot of the guys, um, they started calling me for jobs after it was over. And I was signed up for my second year of junior college. And I don't even think I withdrew from my classes because I'd found what I had was made for, basically. And I still love it. Oops, I, don't, I can't hear you. For whatever reason, my mic just decided to mute itself. I think it might be a ghost, <laughs> might be a ghost in the house. Um, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's not. There are not many people who get such a clear, concise um, vision of what they want to do so young, and it and it evidently solidifies and presents itself to them in such a way that they have absolutely no doubt this is it for me, um, and, and then. Even if you do get that, having a natural segue into actually being able to do it is that can still be 10, 15 years away, especially for someone who just decides they want to become an actor. Just being talented isn't enough. They've got to be seen by the right people. But if you've got a very niche skill, you're the only girl that can do all these great things on a bike that I mean, there can't have been dozens of ladies queuing up for those jobs that you must have... No, it was usually a man that did it in fact right. um about six months before i got in the business i i was watching a tv show and it was clearly a guy on a motorcycle doing donuts and right. his his neck was this wide and his shoulders were <laughs> this wide and and i went i could do that i wonder how you get in and so i spoke to someone that i knew that 
worked as an extra sometimes and an actress a little bit. And she said it was really hard to get in and you had to either have a Screen Actors Guild card or you had to know somebody who could get you in. And I didn't have either. So I, like I said, I signed up for my second year of general ed. And, um, but then you got yeah, that I, job and, and it kind of all went from there. Yeah. Uh, quick question from David Macy. I've seen a few full body burns and they terrify me just as an observer. How do you mentally prepare yourself for a, what he's talking about as a fire stunt, like the one that we're, looking at in the picture because i know you've done a, a few of those does that require a lot of me mental preparation to do a stunt like that or is it is it horses for courses for you now or what about no, the first it's, it's always there? when you're dealing with fire you know it's of course easy to get burned so yeah. what's really important is the people who set you up for the burns that's super important because if you don't have the right people taking care of you and putting the right amount of fire and the right kind of fuel and all that, uh, and the proper gel, um, then you can get burned. And I early on got burned on the stunt that you're looking at right there. Oh, really? Yeah, it was the jerk. And mm -hmm. I was with Steve Martin and I was had to ride the motorcycle through the wall of fire. And it was thin pine slats. Um, yeah, right there. Thin pine slats. And then they put stabled hay on it and lit it with diesel fuel. And uh, when I was presented with that, I said, well, I'm a little worried about these pine slats just bending, you know, or, and not breaking. And, uh, you know, I was kind of told don't worry about it. You know, guys do it all, all week long in nylon jackets. What's at thrill shows? What's the big deal? And it looks, uh, looks like you've got bare arms in that picture. Yes, I do. And oh, we didn't man. have gel then. We, we didn't have any gel. Right. And I asked if I could wear Nomex and I was told no. Nomex is fire retardant long underwear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but I did sneak a Nomex hood underneath the helmet, and I had the makeup department do it flesh colored. So I'm so grateful that I did because when I went through it, um, it they had stapled it in from the opposite side. And so when I went through, it pulled the staples right out, and my head broke through. But the whole thing came with me. If you go back to the other one, you know, I can show you the, that one. Yeah. See how part, par, it partially broke, but yeah. the whole thing came with me. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was two weeks in the burn ward. But of course, I didn't want to miss out on work. So um, they took me to, one of the emergency rooms and it was Easter weekend and it was on a Friday and they said, um, just, uh, go back to the doctor next week. And so of course my husband and I went out to the desert for motorcycle riding. <laughs> I didn't get on the bike, but it was Easter weekend. And, um, I ended up in the hospital at the emergency room there in Yucca Valley. And uh, uh, they said, boy, this thing, you know, it doesn't look good because burns sometimes get worse, you know, over, over time. You continue to burn depending on what got in your skin. And so, um, so of course, I went to work on Monday and um, I had to do this, this thing where he... Let's see, she has the the flowers and they're shooting through a carousel. So it's going around and around. And and I had to hit him. And I said, can't I hit him with my right? Because all, all my left side was burned. And they said, no, you have to hit him with your left. And so I was all bandaged up and everything. And I was hitting him <laughs> as hard, you know. And uh, it took him a while to get the shot. And after that, uh, 
I went back to the honey wagon and told somebody I didn't feel very good. Yeah. And so they took me to the doctor. I had a fever and I was infected. And um, so they took me to the burn ward finally. And they said, um, the doctor, which was Dr. Grossman, he's famous uh, for, for burns and everything. He came in and he said, looks like we're going to be seeing a lot of you. And I said, what, you want me to come back tomorrow? And he goes, no, you're staying. <laughs> and I go, but I have to work. <laughs> well, I'm sure he had your best interests. Best oh, yeah, interest. yeah. You know, young and dumb, you know. All right. Now, you, you uh, just to give people in, in chat an idea, you have 400 credits on IMDb. We, we went through them all in this very long pre-interview chat that we had, which took place many, many weeks ago. And um, I don't think these will all fit, but um, uh, to give the chat an idea, these were the ones that each of these, the, the list I've just put in chat, were the ones that you had a story about. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to them all, but let's, let's, let's go through these and see how many we can do. Um, there's some I definitely want to touch on, and um, there's uh, others that, for some people, will be quite niche films, but actually are among my my personal favourites. Um, I've got the soundtrack albums to at least probably about ten of your movies on vinyl. I think. Um, uh, Streets of Fire is in a box just behind me. I might try and um, uh, see if I can fish it out. But so. One of the first films you worked on was Death Sport. We've kind of touched on that already. Was there anything else to say about that, or shall we move on from well, there? Actually, I'd like to explain how the jump was done and how we worked cool. up to it. Um, what we did was we set up a ramp on on a dirt road and then measured off how much distance we had to clear. This motorcycle had no speedometer. So um, what I had to do was, you know, we did lots of practice runs to make sure we were hitting it every time. And then I took note of what the engine sounded like in, I think it was third gear. Mm. Yeah. So I, I made note of the gear and the sound of the engine in order to know that I was going to clear it. And so that was... Um, my first big jump and it was a 30 foot ravine and and uh cleared it just fine and you know it was all rough on the way getting there too so there's always variables in what we do where th things are you know a little bit more difficult than they seem because you can do something on the road but then you go off road and everything's bumpy when you're going in and all that. But um, we we all cleared it just fine. So that was uh, a very good learning experience for me. So that, I'm, I, I'm right in thinking that that image there, that's that's a still of that jump from the, the movie. Uh, it is not. Oh, it's but not? Sorry. Uh -uh. That's, that's another jump that I was doing. For the, but that's from the same film. Yes, that's from the same film. That's the smaller. That's the smaller jump you did. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So, so Death Sport, big jump, pretty big stunt to to hit the ground running, so to speak, for your, oh, for your and, career. Yeah, and then uh, I have a really fun story about this. You know, the, I was doing all the motorcycle riding, and that was like second nature to me. I was having a blast. We were just going up hills and down hills, and um, fighting with on the motorcycle and all that. And then the coordinator asked, he handed me a broadsword and he said, okay, I want you to run this, no motorcycle, just run and jump off this embankment and swing the sword at the guy going by, but be a little bit short because you're going to look like he cut his head off. And, um, and I looked at him and I said, you're going to pay me to play? <laughs> Because when I was, you know, I was such a tomboy and I was always outside running, jumping, diving, climbing. One day my 
mom came home from the grocery store and I was hanging from the light post when I was about 11 and my mom was going crazy and my dad came out of the garage and he looked up at me and said, uh, can you get down? And I said, yeah. He goes, how's the view up there? I said, oh, it's great. He goes, stay up there as long as you want. My mom freaked out. But, you know, so at a certain age, my mom told me, okay, you can't play football with the boys. You can't do this. You can't do that. And so I couldn't believe my good fortune when he uh, handed me the sword and, and I got to jump off an embankment and swing it at somebody. <laughs> Yeah, that's a uh, steal from uh, Death Sport. Yep. With David Carradine and the late great Richard Lynch, who's an I'm an absolutely massive fan of Richard Lynch. Um, yeah, he was uh, great. Yeah, I heard. And then David Carradine was. I mean, I um, grew up watching Kung Fu. Right. And yeah, and I actually, when I first got in the business, one of the guys that I worked with, with on death sport was a kung fu master and so he said let's trade skills and he said he'd train me in kung fu so i went over to his house and and his gym and we started training and everything and he goes now have you had martial arts experience before i said no i i always wanted to take martial arts but you know we couldn't afford it and you know all that and so and then later on we're still training and he goes are you sure you haven't had any martial arts experience i said no but i did watch kung fu and then try and do everything in front of the mirror <laughs> so and that was all the training required <laughs> <laughs> at that time anyway yeah I, I I feel like I saw this movie. I feel like I rented it from my local video store. Uh, and I'm guessing you must have doubled for Claudia Jennings in a yes. few bits and pieces. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, most of it. Yeah. In fact, the physical stuff I did as well. Yeah. I, I feel this is a film I need to go back and rewatch. Um, Cause I'm, I've got a big soft spot for, a lot of the kind of um, low budget Italian ripoffs of Mad Max, you know, and there, God, there are dozens of them. But um, mm -hmm. I do kind of, I like these these kinds of films. Not long after Death Sport, you, I mean, you worked pretty consistently. You did a cluster of of movies and shows that people would have heard of, and the the, the few that we wrote down of this era were. 1941, which was the, the the Steven Spielberg movie that was I actually personally really like it. it was a big flop at the time. Airport 1979, which by the way I just got the Blu-ray of that. It's right here. Um, in fact, I got the I got the Blu-ray set of all four Airport movies. Who knew that? Who knew you could get that? And I wow, found, I didn't know that. I found that in a charity shop. And I thought, you know what? It was only a few quid, and I thought, I'm having that. Um, <laughs> I've got a soft spot for the airport movies as well. So, yeah, you're in the one about the Concorde. Oh, uh, yes. Airport 79. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was one of the team, the Olympic team that was flying on the plane. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, uh, my main memory of that film is that Everybody attacks the Concorde for whatever reason. There's various people that need it to get shot down. And there's a lot of shots of all of the passengers going, whoa, you know, from left to mm -hmm. right. Was that the kind of main stuff that you were doing on that movie? Was that a bit uh, more? Yes, that was, that was it. A little bit of acting and a little bit of, uh, you know, flying around and getting on the floor and then getting back up. And, yeah. I'm going to. I'm going to watch that after this interview on my Blu-ray player and see if I can get a yeah. couple of screen grabs of you flying, <laughs> flying through the cockpit there. Um, you did. So what did you do on 1941 with Steven Spielberg? 1941, I was in the uh, UF, USO uh, building. Yeah. You know, the and there was a big fight going on. And so we yeah. were all 
doing a big melee fight. And I was out on the streets when the tank came down the street. And I, that, that and had it, about 200 extras, that scene, at least. It was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was hard. You know, we have a lot of times when there's actors on set yeah. and there's that many actors extras we have to um shield the actors that's one of our jobs is to, because a lot of the background you know because those aren't all union background and uh so they can get a little over amped and want to be in it and uh sometimes threaten the actors you know as far as uh you know push them or hit them or do things so we we were there for a buffer zone as well, um, but I was working on Airport uh, 79, the Concord, uh, at Universal during the day, and then going over to Warner Brothers at night for five days straight. So <laughs> day night day night, that was the longest. Uh, and most intense, uh, you know, back-to-back -back jobs that I've had. Mm. Am I right? I'm sleeping in the back of my pickup truck. <laughs> and then if I get a little extra time, I'd go over to my friend's house and shower. But, you know, Airport 79 was easy, that part. Yeah, compared to, uh, yeah. Compared to, to, to 41. Well, yeah. I mean, this is just a question I'm going to ask you while, while, while I'm thinking of it. So it, I'm sure you know the answer to, th to this. So in scenes like, for example, like the big battle scenes in Braveheart, um, which you could acquaint to the, the, the big brawl scene that you had in 1941, would the typical setup be, apart from obviously you've got, you, you've got a job to, to shield the actors from some crazy extra who thinks, yeah, I'm going to deck Mel Gibson in this shot, you know. Um, is it the norm that the stunt team would be made up of a foreground unit that would be like your most experienced guys and girls, and then you might have a second sort of slightly further background behind them, and then behind them would be the extras who would just be told to look like you're fighting? Is that how a really big action scene with sort of two, 300 people would be divided up? Is that how it would break down on set? Well, you have a stunt performers who are seasoned of course mm. and um then that doesn't have to be somebody with a lot of experience uh it can be somebody who just has a good head on their shoulders which the coordinators kind of assess all of that and then you know they would be the buffer and then also the ones doing the major fighting and all that um yeah. as far as having another like a mid zone um that doesn't really happen so much unless you've got a crowd that's in, in, encroaching on uh what's going on hmm. and then you have several people that their primary job is to keep these people out i think the reason i asked that question is because when i watch these films again and again and again like like braveheart and they have these big battle scenes I'm always looking at what the people are doing in the background because I've seen the yeah. films many times. And I, what I've noticed is, is in the battle scenes, there seems to be layers of ability and the guys right at the back in the right far out of the shop are really just kind of, you know, doing that. Whereas the, the next guy further cl closest to the camera will really be doing something interesting. And then the yeah. people in front of them, something very uh, aggressive and physical. And Yeah, um, it's usually the background that are the ones not doing much. Because the smartest thing is just to tell them not to do much. Sure. Because uh, you put a weapon in somebody's hands, even if it's... <laughs> yeah, rubber or know, whatever, can still do damage. Even if it's just got a hard handle, um, you know, it can go bad really easily. So you, you also worked on, um, I think, the first airplane movie, which, of course, was the comedy version of airport um, yes was was that more of the same was that more of flying around the cabin well, or that it... one was uh we were Hari krishna in the airport oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and robert stack um he was supposed to hit me and every time he he you know we get to the spot where he was going to hit me 
he'd say, I can't hit you. You're so cute. Because <laughs> I can't hurt, hit a girl. And and it was just so funny because I, I told him, I said, look, please hit me. Please, please hit me because that's how I make money. <laughs> And so he he did it, but it, he didn't like that at all. He didn't want to hit a girl. Oh, well, fair enough. Uh, pretty soon after that, you worked on Smokey and the Bandit Ride again. That's the second Smokey and the Bandit film. Uh, uh, with, yes. With, with, with Burt Reynolds, which, mm -hmm. and actually uh, one of the people I interviewed the week before last was Burt Reynolds' biographer, and we did a top five Burt Reynolds movie uh, movies and and in my top five, my number three pick was Smokey and the Bandit Ride Again because it's my favourite Smokey and the Bandit film. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of people deride it, uh, but I thought it was like this. I saw it as a kid. I saw it at the cinema. I loved it. I loved the big scene with all the trucks at the end uh, where they annihilate all the police cars, and um, I, I just I just liked all the the characters and just thought it was a lot of fun. Now, of course, that's a, that was directed by Hal Needham, who I think is a director you worked with more than once. Yes. Hal Needham. Yeah. Um, and, and, and he was kind of a, an almost an expert of the kind of the car chase movie, I guess. Um, yeah. In, he in, did in the, the first Smokey and the Bandit and the second and Cannibal two, two Cannibal run. Yeah. And um, a bunch of other things. Hooper. Uh, Hooper was also in my top five list. Hooper was my, I think, was my number four pick. Sharky's Machine was my number five. And um, The Mean Machine was my number one Burt Reynolds pick, which was called something else in America when he's in the prison and they do the American football team against the guards. Um, oh, okay. I, that was called something else in um, uh, the in in the states would this be the stunt that you did in Smokey and the Bandit um, rides again? Was it the transference of Sally Field from one car to another? No, it wasn't. Um, what I did was I was in a police car. You know how, how the whole formation comes down. Yeah, on the dry yeah. lake bed. I yeah. was I was involved in all of that. Great scene. Great. Yeah, and, and, and well, that was that was cool because it's you know it's hard to make it look like a V if yeah. if people aren't right on their marks. Yeah, and so you know the the guys that were older because I was pretty young then they told me okay pick a mark on the car and that's where you stay on the car next to you so that everyone is picking that same mark and then it it works out pretty good. Yeah, that leads into this scene with the with the trucks, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, how and many? Also, when you're out on a dry lake bed, you get a whole bunch of dust, and it's hard to see anything. I was I was just about to say that because I remember the shot with all the police cars in the V line, and the thing I remember is there's a typical How Needham helicopter overview of it, and you've got a V shaped streak of all this black. Um, and brown dust cloud streaking out behind them, almost like uh, it was deliberate. Very similar to when you have the planes that fly overhead and they have the, the coloured streams coming out the back, except that this is just all brown. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, how many vehicles were on that shoot? Because it was a, that was a, that's a big, big scene with a lot of cars oh, and a lot of trucks. I don't, a I don't even know, but I bet you it was... There was a lot. You must have yeah. had a hundred stunt drivers on that. I would. That's what I'm that. guessing about yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Melvin Deeply, he reminded me that the American name of the Me Machine is the Yon the Longest Yard, which yeah. is my my personal favorite of Burt Reynolds' movies. So, um, you also worked on a very different film, and perhaps this would have been. In fact, I think it was the first historical movie that you worked on. You worked on. Um, Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate. I did. And that was just an amazing thing for me because every Christmas or birthday, I asked for a horse or a pony and I never got it. But um, I did go to camp a couple of times in Colorado where if I wasn't on the horses, I was on the ponies. And so I had some riding experience and the stunt coordinator called me 
who's Buddy Van Horn, famous old stuntman. Oh, God, yeah. He, he yeah, Clint Eastwood's off. double and his stunt coordinator and everything. And big, big cowboy, big, tall cowboy. And he says, so I've got this movie. You want to work on it? And I said, sure. What, what, what will I be doing? He goes, it's a horse movie. It's a uh, Western. And I went, well, um, I really wasn't raised around horses, but then I told him the story about how I always wanted a horse or a pony and I love horses and, um, I had some riding experience and everything. And I said, if you'll have me on those terms, I would love to go. And he goes, you're on kid. <laughs> so I had the time of my life. I mean, I was, a, we did the, the stuff in the town where everybody's leaving the town. Sure. And I had this long, long wool skirt on that just kept soaking up the mud. And one of the guys would ride by and put his arm out and then sling me up on the back with him. And then, um, we were doing other stuff with uh, the Go Devils and riding around in circles. And it was funny because all the cowboys on there, they um, thought it was pretty cool that I was there. And, and they have levels of names for people like Pard and this and that and Saddle Pal. And, and I made it to Saddle Pal, which is really good. <laughs> That's a, that's a sort of level above acolyte or something, is it? <laughs> but oh, but you know, one of the most dangerous things that we did was we, we did a, a river crossing. And they said, you know, make sure you hang on to the main because and just let the horse swim. Keep his head up when you go down, down the embankment so he doesn't trip. And um, so I... I listened and I did it and didn't have any problems because what can happen in the water is, is the horse can start to flip over and then, then you're really in trouble because the yeah. legs are going and, and all yeah. that. But I handled it all really well. And I mean, I, I look back at that and I, I have so many memories. It was so beautiful there too, but Chimino was interesting on that one yes <laughs> <laughs> he um he was very impatient he'd come in we we'd uh, be in a van going two two hours from kalispell and two hours back to kalispell every day and he'd fly in in his helicopter and uh he was just kind of manic and you know, there were times that he, there was a time where he grabbed the button from the effects guy and uh, one of the actors was on a horse over a pot and, and he hit the button while the actor was over the pot. It blew the horse up in the air and the rider, you know, the actor up in the hair, up in the air as well. And both were not in good shape at all. You, so, mean, you mean he hit the button? early accidentally on a like a he flash. wasn't supposed to have the button oh okay so but, but he set off he, one of the explosives early yes when someone was oh my god that's yes that's, that's crazy but um, you know um he liked me though you know because uh he had me doing this thing in the wagon where there were all kinds of squibs and just blood getting squirted all in my face and uh you know, he had me do a lot of different things. So, it, it, I mean, I I watched Heaven's Gate not that long ago. Um, there's a new, um, I think, a new director's cut or something out out of it. And I mean, I get why it was a flop, but at the same time, it's a beautiful looking film. It looks amazing. Yeah, uh, it was funny because we had a lot of downtime on there, and um, there was one of the famous trick roper's sons, uh, Cliff McLaughlin was on the movie and he could trick rope really well. And so I said, can I, can you teach me that? He goes, sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm on the downtime, I'm learning how to trick rope and I'm jumping in the loop and 
and bringing it up and uh, bringing it around my head. And I learned all that stuff. And I was thinking, oh, this is fun, but I'll never use that. It wasn't probably maybe three months later, I was on a TV show, a spinoff of Dukes of Hazard, doubling the lead girl. And um, they said, okay, now we've we've got a little problem. We need uh, you to go up on the loft and the bad guys are going to come in and you have to drop the rope, but I don't know how you're going to get over it over both of them. And I said, well, I can spin a loop. So I went up there and just spun a loop and nice old big loop. They came in, I dropped it on them and got them. So you, you, you did it like the first on the first take. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that must have been pretty cool. You must it was been... really cool. You know, that's the thing about stunts that's really fun is whatever you can do physical, uh, you might use it somewhere. You know, like I scuba dive, I snow ski, water ski, surf. Um, I'm good in the water. Uh, you know, just all these different things. You know, doing that little thing with the rope was was just amazing sure, sure. Well, it's something i never thought i'd do you know need need for work anyways and um so, so you never know so um I, i'll ask you this before i move on to my next movie um okay. are you somebody who likes to go and see the films y you've you've been in when they come out i do but it's funny because when i first see the film I look at what I've done and I go, oh, that was terrible. I could have done this. I could have done that. <laughs> that but I think, I think that's the same for any creative is that we're all quite self-critical. I mean, look, my last feature film, you know, I'd only give it six out of ten on IMDb my, my, myself. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very critical of my own work. I mean, I know all the things that went wrong behind the scenes, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's that's just – I think that's just a normal um, – reaction so I, I but think then if i see the action scene the second time i go that wasn't so bad and then uh the third time i see it i go you know that was pretty good <laughs> so the one of the next films you did which um has its fans and in fact a friend of mine uh who may even be watching right now uh, who also has a YouTube channel, she did a watch party of this movie and got into the whole, went through the whole film. And uh, I used to own this on VHS, and that's Ice Pirates. Oh, uh, Ice Pirates. Yeah, which was... Now, I, in, in preparation for this stream, I, I, I did a lot of background work on every movie, and I didn't realise that Ice Pirates got, like, literally completely rewritten the week before it was going to shoot. And the budget also changed um, from, I think, something like a, an eight million pound film to a three million pound film. Um, but I like the film because it's incredibly inventive, and a lot of the gags work. And it's also the only film I've seen where there's a there's an end battle sequence that takes place while people are aging in time, and the newborn baby turns into the son and ends up saving the father. I don't think I've ever seen a film where that's been carried off quite so successfully before. What, what did you do on Ice Pirates? Because there are quite a lot of stunts in the film. Yeah, um, I was dragging behind a horse. So oh. I, I I was on a rope dragging behind a horse. And that, That's the scene in the desert with the war wheel thing and, and there's some sort of Mad Max vehicles and stuff as yeah, well. We, we did it on stage at MGM, so oh. I'm not sure where it was but it was all like dirt and everything and okay. uh, so uh yeah the i got let go a little bit early from the guy who was riding the horse and and the there were big andalusian horses and one uh was right behind me and it it trampled me it was trying not to step on me but you know it's it's going a certain direction and that's where it went so did you the hospital i went did you did you swear on that occasion or were you in too much pain uh 
Um, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It was, it was my friend. Thank you for reminding me, Keith. It was my friend, retro nerd girl that, that did a review. She reviews old movies and she, she really likes ice pirates. Oh, and then I also did a, a fight with the robot suit on. Yeah. Yeah. So I had this, uh, cool little uh, weapon that had, you know, uh, blades coming out like that, and you just spin it. Yeah, I, I, that's you. And that, I know exactly the scene you're talking about. That's you yeah. in that suit. Yeah. Ah, no wonder the robot was so agile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember that well, and I... They did that thing where the uh, the robots themselves are aging in 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 the final fight sequence because everybody is aging, so all their rivets get loose and start popping out. Right. And, and then you, uh, my husband built like a skateboard thing. Cause he was he was dragging behind the motorcycle when we had like three people on the motorcycle, and he was dragging. So I was on that bike. When they that's were doing in, that. that was around the forum. Yeah, that angle. That's in that chase sequence uh, uh -huh. with a police car thing in it. and So you weren't in this scene with this kind of war wheel device? Um, um, no, not not that I know of. You, you're, you're, oh, there's the, there's the space herpes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get rid of that. That's a good place. <laughs> That's a good place to move on. Um, so... Now, one of my all-time favorite movies uh, that you were in um, was Streets of Fire and um, Walter Hill, uh, of course, um, who's also one of my favorite directors. I probably own most of his movies on Blu-ray. I've got at least six of his movies I've got um, the soundtrack for. I've got, a, I've got a UK cinema quad for Streets of Fire and I have it on vinyl, the soundtrack on vinyl. And the Blu-ray of the movie is on the shelf behind me as well. What did you do? I think, didn't you say you doubled for Diane Lane? On I this? did. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And then I did some other stuff on that. Uh, there was some stuff with the stage mm. when they come in and I can't remember exactly what happened, but, you the, know. The I, bikers I, come in and they, they grab one of them, runs at her and tears her off the stage. So is that you getting? Yeah, yeah that was me. Right. Getting torn yeah. off the stage. Uh, and. And then I rode some motorcycles. Of course, because um, there's some cool bike scenes in yeah. Street of Fire. A lot of cool. And bikes. then I did another drag um, behind one of the motorcycles. Had to be screaming and everything. Oh what? yeah, I remember that scene. Yeah, that, that's you being dragged behind. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, fab, fab stuff. Um, did you did you see Streets when it came out? Because it was a I film. Did. It was a film that everybody expected to be a hit, but for some reason it wasn't. I love it. I loved it when when I saw it, and I I still love it now. Yeah, I worked with Alan Graff on that one, and Walter Hill was just an icon to work for. So that was really nice because he insisted on the studios paying for a a massive tarpaulin to cover the entire set because the, the the majority of the movie is set at night time not all of it but most of it mm -hmm. so and and he didn't want his cast and crew to have to do endless night shoots so pay for a tarpaulin please so my crew can have a nine to five day that's the the true story right i think yeah true. that's correct yep so that's a i mean that's a director who puts his cast the needs of his cast and crew first which i i think says yeah. um says a lot about walter hill would did walter have the the same stunt coordinator uh all the time was was that alan grant no, that was that was benny dobbins right who was before and he was he was walter's stunt coordinator before alan he and, passed and was, away and uh, so then alan alan came in after that right and, and on set and i guess maybe this is a more general question and it, and it may vary from director to director but but um would you um would would all the conversations around what you're going to do in a shot would they always happen with the stunt coordinator or would occasionally the director come over and say hey debbie could you also do this you know well there's there is a chain of command when you're working on set sure. yeah. because uh, there has to be for safety yeah um so if the 
if the director ever asks me to do something, I go over to the stunt coordinator or I bring the stunt coordinator in and say, you know, this is what we need. Um, or this is what he's asking me to do. Is that okay with you? Sure. I guess my question was not, not relating to the specific stunt so much more in terms of him saying, Oh, by the way, uh, you know, Diane Lane does this thing where she flicks her hair. Can you try and match that for me? Do, do, oh, you, yeah. get that, do you get that kind well, of I get that kind of feedback all the time. Yeah. And I love it when directors direct, you know, yeah. I, I don't like it when they just expect you to know what they're thinking. <laughs> yeah. I hear so, you. On that. So no, I don't mind direction at all. I love it. Makes me, makes me feel like I'm part of everything and, and I'm in, an important part of what's going on. And I like to be able to help tell the, the story and make it seamless so that they don't know there's a stunt double. Sure. So um, one of the films I watched literally two days ago in preparation for this was Terminator 2. And I believe you doubled for Linda Hamilton on that. Yes, I did. Um, do you, and I think you had some things you, you, and I think then you, I mean, we can talk about them both together. I think you also then came back and you did some doubling on Dark Fate, Terminator Dark Fate as well. Is that I right? did. Yep. Uh, do you want to perhaps talk about those two? Yes. Um, well, Linda Hamilton was really a gifted athlete herself. So what I would do is I would help her. You know, I would rehearse everything like in the insane asylum when she's running away. I get tackled um, or I fall down. I can't remember which right now. But anyways, I fall down and um, I had to train her to do what I did. And I also took took her with, through many other stunts as well. In fact, you know, when, when she has the shotgun and she's limping and they're in the, the foundry, uh, the steel mill, and, and she's, you know, cocking it like this with one hand, um, I had to work all that out and teach it to her. So that was pretty cool to be involved at that level, you know, to um, make sure that if she could do something, we had her do it. Uh, I still did a lot of stuff, but it was mo mostly the really dangerous stuff. Well, I mean, by the time you'd got to doing Terminator 2, which is a very action and weapon heavy film, and, and one of the things I remember about Linda Hamilton in that movie, and, and this still is a good example, is there's several scenes of her very expertly stripping down weapons. And, mm -hmm. and cleaning, you know, AK seventy fours and whatnot. Is is that a skill that you would perfect your your yourself, or would they not get you to do those kind of shots? No, In they don't get me to do those kind of shots because those are things she can do. And and you know, if the actress can do it, then then it's great. If the actress can't, then I learn, you know, what what it is that needs to be done and do it. Sure. I mean, is is that I guess it depends where you're focusing your 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 stunt work. Um, but it, is that a? I've noticed a lot of my friends in the stunt profession in the UK, they will all go on either weapons courses or indeed a lot of them teach them now. Um, you know, teach actors how to correctly, not just um, things like strip down a gun, but also to hold it correctly, do the recoil correctly, because a lot of the the effects are added on with. CGI these days. So is that the, the the sort of thing that you you would have taught yourself how to do or felt felt was necessary in case you were given a role that required a lot of ar arms weaponry? In, if, in the movie? if I was given a role that that had that in it, I would do more. But I I was mostly driving and riding motorcycles and doing. The mm. bigger physical stunts, like getting hit by cars or falling downstairs or things yeah. like that. So that wasn't my forte. And I also have three kids. Right. So life was really busy for me. Yeah. Where yeah. a lot of the stunt performers, they're they're not as um, 
involved in family. Sure. And so, you know, I, I'm okay. I'm not proficient, you know, to any huge level, but I believe I could be really quickly. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't doubt yeah. that for a moment. I don't doubt that. Yeah. What was it like working with, I, I know everybody in chat is, and thanks for everybody that's watching, by the way, do please uh, share the stream. Um, what was it like working with James Cameron? Um, I enjoyed working with James Cameron, but he's, he's different. And, you know, James uh, worked at New World Pictures and he lived in a trailer on the lot. And at first he was a painter and then he started doing little things here and there, you know, uh, he, so basically he learned how to do everybody's job. So when you're on set with Jim and I saw him eat up so many people because they would, you know, he'd say, well, you really messed that up and he'd be mad and they'd, they try and blame it on somebody else or make up some excuse. Well, he knows how to do that job himself. Right. So you can't, you can't do that. There's, um, there's, there's no getting away on, on his yeah. side. So, so anyways, we were working at the Cyberdyne set and right. I was doubling Linda and I had to, there were lots of gunshots and explosions and fire and I had to, dive out of the way of something and i did it going on what the co stunt coordinator told me and jim says to me he goes what was that what was that and i said well obviously jim i didn't do what you wanted um can you please explain it to me again and i will do my very best to get it and so he explained what he wanted and and I did it, and he, from then on, he called me the Debster. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I wasn't afraid when he yelled at me. It's just like, oh, well, he's the director, and he didn't like what I did. So what is it that you want? Please tell me. And uh, so and unfortunately, a lot of people try to cover their tracks, and it doesn't work very well with Jim. No. No, this is the scene that we're talking about where, uh, you know, the SWAT team are coming into the Cyberdyne offices and there's a lot of explosions and water sprinklers are going off and all of that 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 stuff. So you would have been doubling for Linda in some of this action. Is that, is that correct? That, that's correct. And then also in the police cars, I, I was one of the police that came in, you know, filled in. Oh. I, I actually, when I watched it a couple of nights ago, I spotted that there was one female officer in that group and i'm sure that must have been you well actually there were a couple <laughs> yeah i mean i just noticed i noticed one yeah. quite prom prominently in the foreground i'm sure there were uh -huh. but but um yeah so uh, i was thinking oh maybe that's debbie um yeah and of course he's a he's a no waste filmmaker so no doubt as soon as he's done with you in in the shot up there he's going to have you in the shot down here in a different uniform you know that that would definitely be cameron all over um <laughs> So, um, yeah, the man, can he tell a story? Oh, yeah. Wow. Do, I mean, do, look do at his one? movies. It's just people love them. Yeah. And, and he really cares about his product. He really does. And yeah, some I, people don't like him, but I do because I, you know, a lot of times you directors are tend to be more eccentric and you know, they have their own little quirks and you just work around them. Mm. Um, so you you circled back around and you worked on Dark Fate as well. Yes. Um, which I know is much further down the timeline in your career. But is it, uh, I think there was a story you wanted to mention about Dark Fate, but we can move on if that's gone. Um, um, well, I worked on Dark Fate and then I worked on a film called Black Moon Rising. That uh, was with... Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. And yeah. Linda. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, uh, yeah, we're, that one was fun because I had to hit somebody with a car in a building and we're doing a chase thing. And then the garage is going up and I have to clear underneath the garage just 
just as it gets high enough. And then um, there was another thing where I was in uh, on a car carrier on the lower level. And then there was a narrow road right here. And I had to throw a reverse, uh, was it 270, I think, 240, 270, where you come off, off the ramp onto the street and pitch it around to where you're going to go out that way. And there really wasn't enough speed to get it done, but somehow I managed to do it. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. And then um, the last Terminator, it was so good to see Linda again. I ended up doubling Mackenzie Davis the most most of the time. You know, the big, tall blonde? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was in the pickup truck doing all that stuff with the big... Uh, um, massive dirt mover that was squashing me into the rails and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was really good to work with Linda again though. Cause we also did beauty and the beast, the TV show. That's right. Yeah. 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 And you, you did, mo you did most of the doubling for her on that show, I believe. Yes, I did. Yes. Did you, um, just sticking with black moon rising for a second, did you actually, um, drive the black moon car for some of the stunts? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how did that vehicle handle? Because it, it doesn't look like the, the easiest drive. I've got to be honest. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't. Um, yeah. It, I can't remember because it was so long ago. I'm sorry. No, that's but all right. But there I mean, was your one vision. thing that we did on there. We were working at the Firestone plant, the old uh, Firestone tire plant. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'll use bleach on the tires to, mm -hmm. it was more of a, it wasn't that vehicle. It was a more like a tank type thing. I'll and see I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, we had to get in out of the top of the car. And um, so somebody poured bleach on the ground and it was a chemical reaction reaction with whatever was on the ground and uh it smoked us out with really bad <laughs> oh man it was horrible yeah we yeah. just really got out sounds like that that was a uh, 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 an unintentional but potentially fatal accident so it's probably just as well yeah here. yeah that was that was kind of crazy you know because you don't think about it um a lot of times they'll use bleach to um put on the tires when they want you to do a burnout yeah. yeah so that you get that white smoke coming off of it and everything but so, it didn't work out so good that day so you did at least one movie for canon and funnily enough i did a massive dive on someone else's channel about all of the canon films we did we did everything it was we, it was three parts it was we really went into it um, and I used to work for Canon in their offices in London briefly in this period okay. um, because we had all the big billboards for Cobra and all the big standees came in and uh -huh. it was like, got to push Cobra, Cobra, Cobra. Uh, and I believe you worked on Cobra, which was directed by George P. Cosmatos, the crazy Greek director, I've been told by, by some. Uh, I believe yeah. you had a story about that and I'm dying to hear it. Yeah, well, you know, we were doing all this writing, they put me on the back with my husband and I had a, a six gun. And so he, he would always yell, get the girl with the gun, get the girl with the gun. <laughs> Cause I, he liked the way that I pointed the gun and you know, the attitude and everything. And uh, so we were coming around in the, in the gravel and my, my husband was spinning, you know, shooting dirt uh gravel out the back and i'm shooting at things and it was fun yeah but we, how, we we did a lot of stuff on that how how was george as a director to work with because there's quite a lot of stories about him out there um particularly on tombstone which i think was the last film he did for hollywood where it's been said that kurt russell effectively ended up directing most of the movie um yeah I mean, how did you find him on a on a, a Stallone film? And how was it working with Stallone as well? Um, 
it was it was good working with Stallone. I wasn't around him that much. I on Cliffhanger, I was around him quite a bit. So that's coming right up. Okay, but um, George was a little crazy, and a lot of the the people above were complaining about you know what was going on, and it was I guess it was a nightmare for the people that had to organize everything. Right. So, but like I said, he liked me. So you would have been in this scene, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I was thinking, cause you know, there's motorbikes. You've got to be in there. You've got to be one of the gang. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. In my husband was too. And, and, uh, he actually did, there was an explosion where the, the bike goes, the motorcycle goes flying through the air and, um, and then he's flying through the air as well. Right. So and he was doing that with his, uh, his air ram. He makes air, air rams, yeah. and those are. Do you know what they are? I do. Yeah, my yeah. Uh, one of my stunt coordinators, Steen Young, has got several of those, and they basically propel you. Yeah. Through, through the air to a certain distance, uh, the the depending on how strong they are and all of that. I don't quite understand exactly how they work, but um, yeah, it's on <laughs> hydraulic air pressure, and you know, you it's a platform, and you step on the platform and it has a, a a trip and then it it flings you through the air so those are a lot of fun we've got them all different sizes I can for stage because <laughs> stage you know it doesn't come up so high sure it doesn't throw you as far but he I, went flying on the, on that one yeah i remember the stunt because i saw i mean i was working at the cinema at the time that when cobra was released um, and I must have seen the movie, or I could go and see it for free. And I must have seen it like six or seven times. Oh, and then so. he was riding over cars and stuff too. Yeah, there were some there were some very very good um, yeah. stunts in the movie. It's just a shame that they didn't, you know, pay equal attention to the script, which uh, I think was a little <laughs> little bit weak. But yeah. um, you you worked on several of my favorite films around this time. Going to mention a couple for the benefit of the people listening. Uh, Robocop, two films with John Carpenter, Prince of Darkness, and They Live. And if you look uh, behind me, up above, I don't know if you can see that, but I have a massive They Live poster on the wall right there. Ah. Uh, and I also have the soundtrack to They Live on vinyl, and it's also signed by none other than Roddy Piper. Wow. And I have a very funny picture of me and Roddy Piper together at the time that that was signed. And you won't believe how nerdy I look in that photo. Maybe you will <laughs> believe it. Um, uh, and you also did Cliffhanger, which my my friend Craig Fairbrass was in. He played the young British uh, member of the gang who, who ends up getting kicked off the mountain after Stallone has put the shotgun in his, his stomach. So, I mean, let's pick up on that because that's another Stallone picture. Okay. Was it was it you that did that stunt at the beginning, hanging out on the wire? Was that you? No, um, there was another double there, and uh, I came and replaced somebody um, for a certain reason. I'm not going to say. Okay. But, um, I was actually in on the set at Chinichita, uh, the that, the, the studio in Rome. Right. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I and they that. had the whole the whole rock face and everything. Right. And so um, I was up above, and Sylvester was coming up, and he looked at me, and I know he wasn't happy about having the harness on, you know, because there was a cable going through the rope. Then right. and he was hooked onto the harness. And so he was not very happy. I said, I said, hi, I'm Debbie. And he just kind of didn't pay much attention to me. So I figured, oh, he's probably miserable because he's got the harness on. And so um, I was actually hanging below him on the same rope, which means the cable, cable was going right through his crotch. Right. <laughs> and... So when we would, because we, what we were doing was we were going from side to side, you know, like this across the rock face. I and know as, the scene, yeah. As soon as, as soon as they would cut, I would land and then 
climb up so that I took the pressure off. Right. From then, <laughs> from then he liked me. <laughs> okay. So, I, so you would have been so I, doubling for Janine Turner in this very scene that we've got yeah. the, the shot of. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And so, so I, I like to say I had him by the balls. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people can say that about Stallone. <laughs> um, in, in yeah, but he really appreciated me taking the weight off. <laughs> how did you find? I don't know if that was your first time working in Europe, but how, I mean. Were there marked differences between the um, the way the American and the Italian crews worked? Because I've been to Chin Chinchitta and um, I've done the tour of the studio. They've still got the setup of Rome and they've got some other sets up, bits and pieces. And I was really impressed with the place. I thought it was fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. And there's such, so much history there of, of, you know, you could really feel it, the history of the place when you walked around it. What, do, I mean, were there marked differences or did it, just feel like business as usual because it was a big American production? I felt like business as usual because it was mostly an American crew. Right. You know. Um, better, because... catering, better catering because you're in Italy or <laughs> more pasta perhaps? Yeah, more pasta for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, I but mean, it, was, it was fun. Um, my husband has a story where they were at Chinichita and um, – there was a gang of people that came in and stole all the per diem. Oh my God. Like $700,000 worth of money that had been stolen. Wow. Cause they, you know, and yeah, yeah that, that doesn't happen in the U S uh, for anybody watching who doesn't know what a per diem is. Uh, basically when a crew a production team is working overseas, uh, cast and crew all get allocated um, a cash money envelope that they're given on a daily basis which is okay you're away from home you can't go home to eat tonight so this is your per diem this covers you for your food and your other expenses while you're filming on location that's basically a per diem so if they stole the per diem cash box for cliffhanger yeah that would be a pretty big uh it was a big big yeah. amount of money yeah uh i'm sure that was an inside job <laughs> Yeah, somebody Some, knew about it who knew somebody who could do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things I love about Cliffhanger is the supporting cast. Um, uh, John Lithgow, of course, everybody will know. Rex Lynn is a fantastic supporting actor. Uh, we don't see – I don't know if he's still with us, but we don't see him in enough uh, things, and he's absolutely brilliant in, um, in, in, in the movie. Of course, Leon – I think that was one of Leon's first – acting roles um uh in the in the film and certainly my friend craig it was his um big big movie debut you know that was the, that this was his first big film so um but the italian crews largely the same then in, in terms of their work ethic and everything like that i wasn't around them enough because like i said i came in and replaced somebody for a short time sure so um but like I also said is that it's really important that you have English speaking people working yeah. with English speaking people. And yeah. so um, most of the core crew was uh, American or British. Right. Okay. So yeah, HODs and, and you know, that kind of thing, I guess. And um, then they probably had some Italians working under them. Now, around the same yeah. time as this, you did another movie uh, with another favorite actor of mine um, who sadly is no longer with us. I remember we, 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 we talked about this and you said, oh, I've, I've got a nice story about him. So I'm just trying to provoke your memory in case. And that's Gregory Hines. Uh, Eve of Destruction is the name of the film. Um, yes. I think you doubled for this lady. Yes. Rene, I don't know how you pronounce that. Rene Sutton, Sutton Dick, D D Sutton Dick. She's probably yeah. Scandinavian, I suspect. Yes. Yes. Uh, I doubled her. I, I doubled Rene and um, Gregory was just the nicest person. Um, just down to earth. And we must have talked for 45 minutes. You know, he just. Uh, was a normal person and a, a good guy, great actor. 
just very kind to everybody. And mm. so it was really, you know, when I found out that he had passed, I was, you know, sad because he was one of the good ones for sure. I've heard numerous stories about Gregory Hines, all of them, you know, not only triumphing his professionalism, but just that he was the warmest guy. He would go and talk to everybody on the set, including all of the extras. And, you know, you know, he'd have his lunch. He, he wouldn't sit in with his trailer. He'd go and sit with the crew and, you yeah. know, stories like that. And, and that, you know, that, that makes a lot of difference to the atmosphere on a set, especially when this is your lead guy. Yeah, it's, it certainly does. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Somebody asked what, I don't know if you met him, but what Paul Walton on Cliffhanger was like, the actor Ralph White, who, of course, is, uh, has passed away now. Did you? I did wasn't you? I wasn't there with him, so. I'm... I, I was going to say I wouldn't have thought yeah. you would have been on the same unit with him, and I imagine he must have been in and out pretty sharpish um, yeah. on, on that movie. So, sorry, uh, Melvin, I'm afraid we can't. Um, uh, tell you about that one. You, well, you also... I have a good stunt story for Eve of Destruction. Yes, please. Um, she was driving a, a red Mustang, and um, you know, I'd been doing all the driving and everything, and then they they wanted the car to hit a BMW that was sitting across across on the road, and um they decided they were going to do a, uh, special effects. So, which are practical special effects, not visible. Sure. Sure. And so they had a hook on it. They had it all set up to have it. What they do is they do it on a two to one. So they'll, they'll have cables and they'll have the car driving away from it or a truck driving away from it, which pulls it forward at twice the speed. I see. So, Anyways, they, they had everything set up, and, and I said, but the coordinator was John Moyle, and I said, but John, I can do that. And he goes, no, no, we're going to do this. And we were on a, a road, I think it was Mulholland, and there were a bunch of trees out on this, uh, you know, on the perimeter, and then there was a para parapet with uh, the camera on top of, you know, um, scaffolding out out in front a little bit and so rolling and action this thing comes and it's probably doing 60 miles an hour and <laughs> it all of a sudden just veers off and just flies off and hits one of the huge trees thank god it hit that tree because it was right in line with with the scaffolding that the camera guys were on God damn, that would have been the car and everything. And so I just went up to John again and I said, John, I'll do it. <laughs> he goes, uh, no, I can't ask you to do that. And I said, you're not, I want to do it. I, I'll be fine. I know how to do this without hurting myself. And he goes, okay. So I came in at about 52 miles an hour and what I did was I have this this thing that I I figured out on my own for making it when you hit something solid or or have to hit something really hard. Um, what I do is I lean my seat back and then I put a lumbar support and I have a kidney belt on, which is like a back brace. Yeah. And and then instead of wearing a regular helmet, which is heavy. It will make your head do this. I put a skateboard helmet on that they put the wig over. And then I take two soft cervical collars, one I wrap with tape, and one fits inside the other so that it's like this. And then I, I take uh, flesh-colored nylons, and I cut them, and I, I pull the, the um, nylons over the, the uh, neck yeah, brace. The, the neck brace. And, and so they honestly don't really see anything. And instead of, you know, having something hard, your, your head moves normally, sure. um, but it doesn't go all the way to your chest. No, it's protected. So, to a, to yeah. A yeah. So, and then I wear the shin guards and everything in case it comes in. And then also they reinforce the front end 
of the of the car. And so they had the the BMW sitting on the side of the road, and they gutted it, and then they put um, two cables that were about this big around each around each axle and they gave me seven feet of travel well i hit it so hard that the the car went up like this the wheels came rear wheels came off the ground and it tore the wheels off the axle <laughs> so that was pretty cool so um you you i'll touch on this real quickly because i want to move on but you okay. did do two films for John Carpenter, They Live, which is a classic, um, you know, it did so-so at the time, but everybody, I think, agrees it's a work of genius now. And Prince of Darkness, both of which I have the vinyl soundtracks for in a box just down here. Um, any any particular stories about them? And, I mean, how was, how was John to work with compared to uh, other directors? Because I got to ask um, Roddy Piper that question, actually, when I met him. Fun, and he went... Yeah, man, he's far out there. That was his response. He's far <laughs> out there, man. Um, yeah. Never, never forget that. But how did you find working with him? What did you have to do on those those movies? Uh, well, on Prince of Darkness, I had to wear this horrible mask, prosthetics, and do a fight, and <clears throat> that that all went well. He was really, you know, engaged. But he has his stunt coordinator, Jeff Amata, and um, Jeff is a martial artist, great martial artist and everything. And he makes sure that he choreographs everything. Right. And so John was kind of quiet, but he was also very nice. He, he uh, wasn't aloof or standoffish at all. He was, uh, you know, you could tell he, he wanted his own input put in to the thing. He just didn't do hands off. You know, sure. he he was part of talking with Jeff about what what he wanted and all that. Very professional. But did you, you know, did you double this lady for the the bit where she gets kind of thrown through the mirror? Would that have been the prosthetic? No, that that, that wasn't me on that one. But oh, okay, so that wasn't that wasn't you for that. But shot. that looks like the kind of makeup I had. Yeah, <laughs> I I'll... scared myself when I looked in the mirror. Yeah, I can I, I can imagine. And then on They Live, I believe that one was the one where I was wrapped in a, a sheet and I hit an air ram and hit a wall. I that would have been um the scene where uh the kind of rebel encampment gets attacked and a whole lot of people get machine gunned through the window and there's a lot of very big Walter Hill throwbacks of people into walls and things. I'm guessing it was that sequence because I've got it in my head and i've watched the yeah, film many I kinda, times. I kinda, uh, well i hit an air ram and i hit, hit it like this yeah. against the wall yeah i was wrapped in a sheet fantastic um melvin has just asked me do you have any questions about banshee that's the tv series you worked on that right i did work on banshee but i honestly can't remember exactly what i did it was some car stuff and it was pretty intense but you know, I wasn't really crashing or doing anything like that. I have the whole show right here, all all the seasons. This is probably in my top ten um, sort of gritty drama series of all time. My favourite is The Shield, which is also behind me just there. Uh, most people like The Wire, but my favourite cop show is The Shield. But mm. Banshee is, is fantastic writing, and I, I'm going to be doing a big stream about this. So oh, great. when I when I look, at, well, I've got to watch the whole show again because I've only watched it once. So this is waiting to be viewed. I'm going to be looking at all the female stunt people and seeing if I can pick out. What you <laughs> um, yeah. And the cars, it's funny because a lot of times they'll like blur, blur the windshield a little bit if they want to hide you. But a lot of times I can go, that's me. Sure. Yeah. Um. So. Pulling away from kind of the 80s, and my God, it took us ages to, to, just to get to that. I mean, going through uh, the, the the stuff you did in the, in, in the 90s, um, you, you worked on a lot of stuff, um, and then early 2000s as well. So you did Mission Impossible 2, which is the one that everybody hates, but I really like it. 
Hmm. Um, I'm a big John Woo fan. I like anything with slow motion motorcycles and machine guns. And in Mission Impossible 2, you've got that in spades. I'm guessing you must have done some of the motorcycle stuff in Mission Impossible 2. Would that I be... did not. I drove the oh. Audi Quattro TT, the silver one. Oh. Um, yeah, when when they were up on the mountain road. And that that road, it was way down. I mean, it was probably a thousand feet down if you made a mistake. Yeah, I remember the uh the yeah. drop was the drop was pretty uh it was like yeah. six eight hundred feet, you know, it was a lot. So um yeah, but that's the one that they compared to a dance. Right. Um yeah. Which it kind of was, you know, because we were diving in and out and playing cat and mouse and you know I'm hitting him and then I spun him out and yeah, it was a pretty good sequence. I got a stone award for that. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I get, I get that it's sort of the series was kind of still finding its feet, but I just, I thought it, I'm, I'm a big John Woo fan. I took my dad to see that one. Uh, and, and I've got a lot of pleasant memories of seeing good films with my late father. And, and that was one of them. And, you know, we really had a good time watching that, that movie. You also, um, did some work on another big guilty pleasure of mine. I think it's a fantastic film. Don't care what anyone says. Um, I'm a massive fan of the first Independence Day movie. What <laughs> What did you do? I know, right? What did you do on that? Well, that one was when uh, we were all on the runway, and you know there was mayhem going on. All the pla all the all the uh, alien planes are coming in and blowing yeah. stuff up, and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lots of explosions and uh, running around and chaos and all that. Yep. So you would have been probably dressed up as an American uh, fighter pilot, maybe, or or were you one of the civilians uh, Civilian. with the caravan? I, I was one of the civilians. Yeah. So that would have been this sequence right here. I'm guessing. Yep, that was it. I know my films and I know my shots. Uh, yeah. I'm going to have to call you when I can't find something. <laughs> yeah, no, please. Absolutely. Look, I mean, <laughs> one of the one of the reasons I love Independence Day is when I sat down and I watched it and I went on a Saturday afternoon and I, got, I had a gut feeling from the trailers that this movie was going to be something special. And they brought a series of posters out and I've got all four of them actually in a, in a, uh, somewhere stored away. Um, when I came out of the 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 movie theater, I thought that was just like seeing Star Wars for the first time. My God, I was really like, you know, I was just totally in the world. I was blown away. And for me, that's pure cinema. That's what cinema is about. Um, a lot of people experience that with the first Jurassic Park movie, which I think came out around the same time as this. Uh, yeah, I love I, I watch Independence Day at least once a year. So, again, I'm going to be looking out for you. That was where was was that shot on the the, the salt flats? Uh, um, is that where that was filmed? No, it was. Where were we? We were. I think the background was put in because we were at some big open lot somewhere. And is it was it a question of they got you in because it was a big scene, a lot of extras. You weren't doing your usual vehicle, cars and bike stuff, but it was like we we need some more female stunt people because th these are all civilians we need as many female stunt people as we can have so is that kind of how you ended well, up with that? um i like i said before i got hurt in, well before i got hurt in 07 um mm. i did regular stunts as well as cars and motorcycles sure it was yeah. normal for me to do that Right. Okay. So, so that would have just been part of the the uh, Debbie Evans package, as it were. Um, <laughs> now, you also did Showgirls. I can't wait to hear what you did on that. Oh gosh, <laughs> none of us knew what the outfits were going to be like. <laughs> uh, please tell us more. <laughs> we were all in the uh, on the stage riding the motorcycles. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's well, what we were doing. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if there's a still of that on IMDb. Um, yeah, and thank God I didn't know what was going on around me. <laughs> I mean, I heard that that, that <laughs> I heard that shoot was pretty crazy uh, from a few people. Yeah, um, and um, you know, probably a, a few people on that production 
doing a, a too many recreational type items. Don't want to get into all that. But, yeah, um, well, it was I, it was in Lake Tahoe, South Lake Tahoe. Yeah. That's so, the horizon. So it wasn't actually shooting in Vegas. No. Oh, that's interesting. So we, they probably well, just did. A I mean, they, part of it might have been. Yeah. But the part that I was involved in was in uh, South Lake Tahoe. Right. Um, so that. So that that was like the internal uh, set of the dance sequences and right. all that, that yeah. kind of thing. So that that would have been where uh, these sets, I'm guessing, would have been housed um, yeah. for the various. That's I mean that's interesting because you would have thought that would have been on a studio lot in one of the the, the big studios. Why Lake Tahoe? Was there any particular? Was that a question? I of, don't know. If we do it in Lake Tahoe, we can keep the outfits under wraps. That's probably maybe the. Uh... Well, I, I don't. I think it was more. Let's go to Lake Tahoe. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, a nice place. There's, it is. Uh, there's lots of casinos and lots of things going on there. Uh, yeah, that's true. There would have been a lot of lot of buildings and things that could could have doubled. I could see why that yeah. that that would have worked. So, see, Debbie has been in everything from Independence Day <laughs> to Showgirls. Now, you did you did a couple of other of my favourite movies around this time. You did What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. You did Magnolia, which is Paul Thomas Anderson's second movie. I think one of his best. That and Boogie Nights, for me, are his two best films. What what did you do on each of those? Because I'm really – those are two – diametrically very on, different on what dreams may come yeah. when um there's an accident that happens in the tunnel that's that was, right that was right. the broadway tunnel in san francisco and uh they made rain on the outside and it was like the rain was way too big and i was dr driving a porsche 911 and i had to do a head-on near miss with with somebody and then go back and then i hit a pipe ramp and the director at the beginning said it'd be nice if you hit the top of the tunnel well that's <laughs> about 18 feet in the air <laughs> and, I, I, yeah, um, so we kind of figured it out if i hit the pipe ramp between and a pipe ramp is what we use a lot of times to to flip the car over it's a pipe that's that's got a structure, you know, um, holding it like this. And so what we do is we put the inside of the wheel, the, the wheels just outside it. And if we do it just on the outside, it flips it over slower. But this one, I mean, uh, a little bit quicker. If this one, we decided to do right off center, just slightly off center enough to where it would flip it over but enough to get height as well so i hit it about uh i think it was 50 between 50 and 52 and it went up and it broke the light at the top of the tunnel and i mean then, you can actually see the car in that shot it's difficult to see but that is the car up in the air down down in the center of that shot i don't know if people can see that in the chat see if i can enlarge it slightly but there you go so that's you in that vehicle right yeah and i was up there so long i was saying to myself uh the ground is coming the ground is coming oh this is gonna hurt the ground is coming but it because i hit the top of the tunnel it it uh landed on the back of the car which of course you know, gave me a cushion before it hit and rolled. So I, I think I went 90 some feet before I hit the ground and then another 90 some feet it slid. So they they use that for two, two crashes because, you know, he sees the one crash. Yeah. He goes to help the, the girl and then they see it from another angle where um, the car is coming at him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to read this comment out from RK, who's one of my regulars. Respect to Debbie for the risks she takes and, and has taken over the years in order to entertain people for a movie shot that takes seconds to watch, 
but months to plan. I think that's a very well-earned well, well earned, uh, comment. Thank you, RK, uh, yeah, for saying thank that. You. Uh, one of the things we did say when we were prepping the interview, how and, and I'll, I'll say this myself as well, I think it's absolutely criminal that there is not a Best Stunts Oscar. I mean, even if it's given out on a different day or whatever, so the ceremony isn't as lo you know longer than it needs to be because I, I know the running time is the consideration, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a major facet of movie making. And sure, I know there are stunt awards, various kind of award stunt uh, you know, categories that, that happen in award shows of their own, but there should, there should be a stunt category uh, in the Oscars, and I'm just going to put my cards on the table now and say yeah, that. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, that's needed to happen for a long time, but I'm not yeah. sure. I mean, I ever will, you know, and it, and if there is a stunt award, it'll probably be for the stunt coordinator. Now you, the director, you got a, you've got a couple of stunt awards um, yourself. Uh, and I've probably got a picture of you holding them somewhere. Now, I believe that they were for Superman Returns mm -hmm. and Taxi, which is the French, which originally was a French movie remade with Queen Latifah. Um, can you tell us something about um, uh, Superman Returns first, what, what the stunt was and, well, and what that involved? Superman Returns I did in Sydney, Australia, <clears throat> which... Right is quite interesting um yeah. so i drove the blue ford mustang for um posey parker right yeah and so they supposedly cut her brake lines and uh she she's you know up on the sidewalk and down hits a car and keeps going and and then uh i they they put a ramp up uh, in the uh, walkway where they uh, have all the shopping, but it was downhill. And so I, I hit the ramp and went flying and hit the ground. And then I had to split a bunch of the cars that were going across. What happened was, this is kind of interesting, is uh, somebody stole some, some set radios. Oh, so, shit. So as I'm approaching the ramp and just ready to go off of it, uh, I hear cut, cut, cut. Somebody messing around on the radio. There's no way I could cut. I was right there. There's no way I could get stopped. And it would have been ugly if I'd done that. So I, I did the jump. And then there were, you know, some stunt drivers clearing. And the thing was, is they stopped when they said cut 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 and thank god the two that were in the worst spots had the wherewithal to see me coming and get out of the way sure because <laughs> there's no way i could have stopped and did that did that stunt actually end up in the movie then yes and was and was it funny enough was it would it it's, would it have been that take oh uh, yeah because you see the trunk the trunk comes open when i land and then I go through the, the cars and then there's those little stairs that I'm going down and down. And then he picks the car up. I, I saw this movie on an IMAX. Um, mm. And I remember the stunt that you're, you're talking about. I've been fishing through the 370 pictures on IMDb, but sadly they nearly all appear to be of Brandon Ruth um, or Brian Singer posing at various parties. So uh, yeah, see a lot of times when we <clears throat> when we do the stunts, they have a whole nother unit that's doing first unit. Sure, absolutely, unit. yeah. And yeah. we're out on a, a second unit. It should actually be called the action unit. Yeah, but we're out on an action unit um, doing the stunts because you know we'll have an actor come to set every once in a while on certain shows like that. Yeah. Just to get their close up in the car. But for the most part, it's just all stunt people. Do you do you ever have actors or in your experience, have you ever had actors drop by to, to the action unit? Because they they kind of, you know, want they just want to see what's happening. They just want to 
see how it's done. It's, does that happen ever? It does happen, but a lot of times we're physically in two very different locations. Sure. But if if we're right there, um, you know, like sometimes the first unit will be a couple blocks from the second unit. And a lot of the actors do like to come watch the action. Yeah, I'd, I'd listen. If, it, if if I was working on a film, I'd be, so I'd be with the second unit all the time. Um, so <laughs> it's the most fun unit. <laughs> ta Taxi was two thousand and four with Qu Queen Latifah. This is mm -hmm. um, written by uh, or co-written at least by Luke Besson, who I think also co-wrote the original um, French version. Uh, directed by Tim Story. Were you doubling Giselle Bunchen on that one? Part of the time. Um, yeah. Not, and I, then whoever the redhead one, one was with, with the uh, silver BMWs. Right. Um, I've got we've got plenty of stills of uh, Taxi. How was Jimmy Fallon? Did you did you get to be on set with him at all? I was on second unit for that one. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, so you would have been with basically with the vehicles and yeah, because uh, I drove the 745i and then the um, BMW M1. Did you get to drive this particular vehicle? No, uh, -uh. it's no good. It's no good telling me what what I tell you now. I don't know the difference between okay the BMWs, the blue one and yeah. the and the uh, silver one. So oh, you, the you red red one, red one too. Yeah, because I don't know the difference between a Mini and a Rolls Royce. I'm, I'm when it comes to types of cars, I'm, I'm, I can tell you the difference between types of skateboards, Pal and Peralta, Santa Cruz, and all that. But cars yeah. is not my forte. The, you the, would have driven this one in the in the movie. Uh, let's see. Was it that one or the red one? I think it was this, the red one. This is the one that Giselle uh, Bunchen certainly drives for some of the the time. Um, yeah. It's been so long ago. I think it was. I think it was the red. Well, that's that's a BMW. Maybe they only drove BMWs, but um, <clears throat> the BMW that they had in the chase was had big old wide tires on it, and so right. <clears throat> what they had to do to keep the from breaking the rear end, they had to shave. Uh, some of the tread on the tires so it'd be like three strips you have the two on the outside and then the one in the middle but um because it was too much rubber it kept breaking the rear end mm. so what i would do is i would come in and set it up and slide and then try and take off and there's so much computer stuff on the bmws that if you you know, went good the first time, and then I come in and do it again, and then it I I had a little bit more energy, and it has that yaw control, and so um, it would cut the power to the wheels. So there was a specific sweet spot that I had to drive in with that car, because if I if I gave it too much inertia and energy, it would go into limp mode. I don't know if you know what limp mode is. No, please do enlighten me. Okay, limp mode is when the car decides it doesn't like what you're doing. Uh -huh. And so it um, starts going at a walking speed. Ah, okay. Yeah, and kind of makes those horrible... It doesn't drives. really work well for a car chase. <laughs> makes a lot so of horrible... horrible I, I had parked it in the parking lot, you know, and looked for the picture car guys to see if they could fix it. Right. And I couldn't find anybody, so I came back and I went, huh, I wonder if I restart it, if it'll work. So I restarted it, and it worked just fine. And so since then, I found out that um, when the car starts learning what you're doing, it'll start cutting the power to the wheels and trying to straighten you out. Right. Which we want to be coming around sliding as far as we can and taking off. So what I do is when it starts to learn, I just shut it down and reboot the computer. Right. Yeah. So that was a pretty cool thing to learn on that one. 
what, then, what what do you do if that happens like in the middle of a take? I mean, is is that an easy thing to regain control of the car and get it to do what you want it to do, or or do you have, do you have to call on the radio guys? We're going to have to cut. I mean, has that happened before? Yeah, it's happened a lot on monster trucks. I was driving one of the big monster trucks, and it was a Dodge, and it had all of the computer stuff on it, right. and we were going across a um, a field that just was very very bumpy and it didn't like that and so i'd be going along great you know keeping up with everybody and all that and and then all of a sudden it would just slow down Mm. and so i'd have to come on the radio i'm in limp mode right mode again (laughs) everybody everybody knows what what that is when you when you say that yeah you've you've done of the Fast and Furious franchise, you've done over half of those movies. I think probably two. I've, been, I've done all but two. All but two. And I, yeah. I've lost track. There have been uh, 11, 11 now? Four and five I didn't do. They're they're gearing up for 11, I hear. Okay. So, so four and five were the only two that you missed. Um, mm-hmm. Mainly driving cars, I'm going to guess. I, I've seen yes. most of the, the films. Did you yeah. work on the last one that paul walker was on um prior to him his tragic tragic passing yeah that must have been i I, i'll tell you now when i when when i went to the cinema to 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 see that and i went with my ex-partner there was not a dry eye eye in that cinema Uh, we saw it on a big screen we deliberately went to see it the biggest screen we could um and um i was very pleased with the way they they handled his ending i, I was, was too and i none of us knew and yeah what was going to happen and i thought they handled it very well because uh he you know to kill him off or do exactly yeah yeah you, you, it, it was know. just handled so well and you know i really appreciate it and then you 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 heard after Paul Walker's death, all these stories came out about. There was one about a couple that were looking in a jewelry store. The guy just got back from Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere, and they couldn't quite afford the ring that they wanted. And they went to buy the cheaper one. And then when they went to buy the cheaper one, the manager said, "A uh, uh, customer's already bought this seventy-five thousand dollar ring for you, sir. I'm afraid you're going to have to take it." He's very insistent. Apparently that was Paul Walker that that did that. Yeah. I don't know if you met him on set, but does that? Did, well, I met him on set, but um, where I really got a chance to talk to him was on on six. We both went home. My grandson was being born, and uh, I was in. Uh, see, we were in northern. We were near Ipswich, mm. uh, northern England, and so we had one four day off spell and my daughter-in-law was late so i got on a plane flew all night uh, got there saturday and he was born sunday i got to hang out with him on monday and left to come back on tuesday so we were paul walker and i were in the airport and um i didn't realize he was on the plane i was on and when it came to customs he he starts jumping out and running and going underneath the ropes and everything like that. And so I I uh, was in first class, so I, I went up to him and I said, hey, boy, that's a good way through there. And, and I realized it was Paul. And we hung out and talked, you know, until he got his luggage. And um, he was going home to see his daughter. So we talked about family and all that. And it just... You know, I don't think much about talking to celebrities or anything like that because sure. I've been around them my whole life. Yeah. Well, since I was 19. And then uh, so we're sitting there, we're talking, and I realized that there's a whole crowd of people <laughs> watching, you know, that probably want to approach but don't approach because so he was also using me as a buffer. Which I didn't know. <laughs> no. You know, but that's a cool thing about Paul is he was he was a real person, a real guy, you know, that just 
liked what he did and liked cars and liked liked life you know just loved life and he had his flip flops on and as soon as his bags came out he says so good talking to you we'll see you on set and he mm -hmm. grabs his bags and he just goes trotting off you know like in a little jog so nobody's following him he didn't need an entourage or anything like that i mean that's you know it's nice to hear that he was a pretty down to earth guy and and again even before his passing i'd always heard pleasant things about him on the grapevine we yeah. should give, we should give a shout out to the guy who often gets forgotten about who was the guy that was in the car with him who i believe was connected to the stunt world but i might be wrong about that but no he wasn't in the stunt world he was in the racing world right yeah, yeah. sports yeah. and racing roger rodas yeah right right and did, did you ever meet roger at all no but my son was at uh, my middle son was is really into cars, and he was at the the meet that they were at for raising money for Row, uh, the nonprofit that Paul had. Yeah, I and I guess the two of them had that nonprofit together, and so, uh, so yeah, that was right near where my kids went to school, where that happened. Fast and I still, drive, I still drive by there sometimes and just yeah yeah that must be um, yeah, you know I mean, it must be difficult but gr great that i guess his so much of him and his career is immortalized forever and, yeah you know not many people can get to say say that the fast and furious films are kind of like you know they these are huge budget big stars top of the game very much kind of 30% dialogue, 70% stunts. So just uh, as we're sort of heading towards wrapping up, because I'm conscious of the time, and I told you this would fly by, and <laughs> we, we haven't even covered half the stuff. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll try and slowly start to wrap things up. Um, uh, how much planning, let's, let's say you're doing a driving sequence, one of the big sequences for Fast and Furious, how much planning in terms of, Right, we're meeting up to discuss the stunt to okay, we're gonna go for a take. Just give us a sense of what's the what's the time span from that first meeting of okay, Debbie, you're gonna be driving this car and this stunt. This is the rest of the team are gonna be doing these vehicles. I know you I know often these things are rehearsed in big car parks and stuff. What's the time span between okay, we're going for a take and our first meeting? Well, a lot of times we'll um, get together and talk ideas right. with the second unit director. And so, you know, which is really fun. They call it spitball, you know. That's the colla you're, co you're collaborating on even the design of the stunt with the, the stunt coordinator. Yeah, there are times like that, yeah. And those are always really fun because, you know, you come up with ideas and when it gets picked, it makes you feel really good. Yeah. And then, so that's even before we we ever do anything uh, physical. And then a lot of our films have been in other countries or other parts of, you know, different states and things like that. So um, we'll go over at least two weeks in advance. And because we have multiples of the cars that we um, use and uh, so we have to check out all the cars because especially the older ones, which a lot of times I am driving one of the older ones, um, <clears throat> they had to buy them from somebody. They just didn't come off the lot and they're all the same. So we have to s s source out the cars and make notes for picture cars so they can fix maybe brakes or e-brakes, which are the rear brakes, emergency brakes. Um, or maybe the hydraulic brake isn't working and, uh, there's all different things that we look for. Um, we got to put, uh, seatbelt, uh, you know, eye bolts in so that we can, uh, put our own, own belts in, um, mm -hmm. the racing belts that we use. And so there's a lot that goes on. There's location scouts, there's walkthroughs. There's things that we do and, you know, two weeks is, I'd say, the minimum time that we've had. What's the, what's been the longest? 
What's been the longest you've prepared for one particular sequence? Well, um, when I worked on six, I was away from home for five months. So uh, we were in England, Scotland, and the Canary Islands, and then back to England. So we had to test all the cars and everything. So probably I was there three weeks before. And then when we go to a different lake uh, location, we would have to go through scoping everything out, making sure the cars were good there, then um, having the walkthroughs, figuring out what we we're going to do, making sure the roll cages were, were correct. Um, so it just varies from show to show. But on the fast movies, lately we've had about, you know, minimum two weeks and as much as maybe uh, three to four weeks. Right. Prepare. And do you, do you have a particular stunt on a movie looking back that you think, God damn, I did a good great job on that one or, or that one that really stands out maybe when you watched it in the finished movie you went yeah um, I, I did a, I'm pleased with, I'm pleased with my work on that was there was there one particular well, the one? first fast and furious going in underneath the semi truck oh and yeah matrix reloaded was really fun because when Andy Wachowski was there um because he was he Larry was over on the fight unit and Andy would come over to our unit with all the motorcycle stuff. Right. And so, you know, we do, we do a stunt and that, that was one of the first times I'd ever had the rehearsal time. Cause we, we got in two weeks early and we went through everything, mapped things out. So we had event one, two, three, four, five, all these different things all kind of mapped out. So that when we got out there, we could just start working. And also the freeway uh, was built on the um, old Alameda Naval Air Base on the yeah, runway. That, that freeway was, it wasn't a real freeway. It was a set. Is that correct? Yes, that yeah, is I thought, correct. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. And so it gave us a lot of freedom to do what we needed to do. But you know, when I was on the motorcycle and going through cars and everything, they were in Video Village. Video Village is a van that has all of the playback monitors and everything. And mm. he, you know, first it started, he goes, hey, that was really good, Debbie. You want to see it? And I said, sure. So I'd go in the van and he'd show me what it looked like. And I go, I can make it better. He goes, <laughs> Because no, originally they thought they were going to have to do that entire sequence CGI. Yeah. And, right. and the coordinator, R.A. Rondell, said, no, we can do this for real. And always, so, always better if it's real. Yeah. Always, always and so, you know, we went out and did it for real. And he was like a kid in a candy store. You know, he was just so excited about everything. And I loved it because. I like seeing uh, what we're actually getting. And then I can make small adjustments and it's really, really helpful. Yeah, yeah. But no, that, yeah, some, sometimes that's... like on a lot of the fast movies, I'm actually driving camera vehicles when I'm right. not involved in doubling. Yeah. Right. So, that, yeah. So, because. Of course, that that would require us somebody of a professionalism of a to keep up with it and everything, and right. the safety required. You'd need a stunt person. I'd never that had never even occurred to me. Yeah, actually. and there's a monitor. There's a Subaru that's got all this stuff on it, you know, and there's a monitor there, so I can I'm looking at what I'm doing, but I'm also glancing at the monitor to see how things are looking, mm -hmm. and then uh, they have a, a Porsche Cayenne that's got a tracker which you can be off in the distance or whatever and and the camera is usually on one corner of the vehicle that goes up and down and then it can pan right and left so that's really cool too because you know 
you just kind of look and see what the frame is while you're driving and everything. I love that part. Yeah, that must so be. much fun. There's one shot in Fast Six where um, they're on a freeway and uh, these two cars just go flying through the air. Well, I'm I'm in this car right here, and the the camera's looking back at, at the action. And my friend Henry Kenji, who's big, tall, it's like six four, super long foot, um, he has a tendency to when right before things happen to really gas it and so right. i'm i'm driving and i'm 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 looking in the mirror and i'm going i'm good i'm good and i look at the monitor and the the camera operator nino's going go debbie go debbie go <laughs> henry mashed it to the ground and uh and but it was the coolest shot ever with that we got with both cars flying in the air I'm gonna. I think at some point I'm gonna rewatch. You see, after after yeah, that, all... that they wouldn't let me do because it was in London and they used two rally car drivers, ah. uh, Mark Higgins and then Ben Collins. I've heard of Mark Higgins. Yeah, and Ben Collins was the, was the Stig. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm up oh, here, that's right. I mean, was yeah. it they, they they wouldn't let you do it because it was in London because what you were used to driving? Well, we were right around of... Piccadilly Circus and all kinds of monuments and everything, and right. so these guys had you know resumes and racing up you know up and down, so they they wouldn't let me do it. I I mean, I would any of that been the familiarity of driving on the other side of the road? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, the cars were all left-hand drive cars. Were you were you? involved in this sequence with six because uh, i don't know if that's the uk or not Can't, the foliage looks a little bit un oh okay no that was in tenerife ah tenerife. okay yeah um those were the two lead guys in there tenerife yeah, we, a... we were on Teno road Teno road is thousands of feet down yeah and yeah. We were just booking, and I was I was in the follow van that time, and right. I'm in some old rental van, just and these guys are mocking through there, and I'm just like raw, you know, trying to get <laughs> up <to> them. <laughs> and uh, this little van is just going raw, raw. <laughs> I mean, I I I found I want to rewatch these movies now because I I, I know you're going to be behind the wheels in a lot of the shots, but um. I found after uh, seven, which is obviously when the Paul Walker story ended. I, for me, I thought that really should be the end of the uh, of the show, and and I, I didn't want to watch any after that. Um, mm. But then I did get dragged to watch one, and you know they had a chase on the ice with a Russian submarine under the ice, and you know that there isn't really a Russian submarine there. Well, you know they, it's CG. They ruined it with too much CGI. Yeah, it, it CGI just got... is okay for like. Yeah, so complimenting things, you know, or <laughs> background in, or you don't want to know the CGI's there. That's that's well, exactly, the, that's and it's view. so obvious that it's there that it's, yeah. it takes you out of that moment. The, the, because um, what I call that is I call breaking the rules of the of the reality of the world that you've established in the script, and a lot of people hate the Pierce Brosnan James Bond film that's got the invisible car and it's got that terrible sequence where he kind of hand glides off a, a falling iceberg. And because mm. we just know that those things wouldn't really happen in that world. And it looked terrible and we could tell it was CGI. It wasn't even a stunt man doing it. Like the time the guy skied off the mountain for real in the spy who loved right, me. You know, right. Uh, that's it's, what's, that's what keeps you interested. No, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I hear this on, film forums or conversations like this on youtube everybody wants practical effects people don't mm -hmm. want okay avatar that's different that's 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 using the technology in a completely different way yeah. um but you know when i go to see an action film i want the stunts to be great but i want them to be believable i want it to be like yeah okay i can believe that that guy could have got out of that car and carried on firing you know or, or whatever i want to I, I don't want to get taken out the world and go come on 
submarine under the ice, really, you know, and it's it's not really there, and it looks like a cartoon. And for me, I agree. That, when I saw that, I went, oh, yeah. And, and I was there. I was I was driving on the ice in the right. You know, I yeah. was. I was driving with studded tires on the ice. Did they have some kind of vehicle on the ice with a green golf ball on a pole or something that was supposed to be the submarine for that, that you guys all kind of had to pretend was there? Or um, I wasn't there for that part. I broke my wrist. <laughs> <laughs> Having an accident. Been a little there. accident. <laughs> you you got to stop doing that, you know. you gotta, you, you got you to gotta stop doing that. But I did get to go to Cuba. So ah, that was cool. That was yeah. That, there were yeah. some cool cool scenes in. There were some cool scenes in 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 Cuba. I yeah. mean, we haven't touched on Wanted, Alias, Cinderella Story, Jeepers Creepers. Um, Debbie was also in um, Spider Man Two, and I know I've got a couple of my friends in the chat who are big superhero um, buddies. Uh, one of them, Josh, one of my moderators, I'm, I've got a few questions from chat here, so we'll bomb through them quickly. What okay. was your experience of working on the Batman like? Did you get to meet any of the main cast? Um, so that would have been the Robert Batson Batman, which was one of your m more recent jobs. Um, yeah, I was on a second unit, and I only did part of it on the most recent Batman. So... Um, I didn't really get to work with the cast at all. In fact, they were in England and directing by uh, video cam. Right, yeah, right. Via downlink. So, would 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 that have been motorcycle stuff that you did again on, yeah. on Batman? Right. Yeah, but but um, on Batman and Robin, I doubled Alicia Silverstone. Ah, uh, for all her motorcycle stuff. Yeah, for the motorcycle stuff. Yeah, and I I did meet Schumacher. And um, yeah, funnily enough, and, I, I've also met Schumacher, sadly passed away and, now. And that that one was the first one that went CGI hog wild. And um, it took me out of the story. I wasn't yeah. really interested once all that stuff started. So yeah. here's, here's another question from Melvin Deeply. Question. Uh, I'll, I'll phrase this carefully. How much do stump people earn? No need for specifics, but I get the feeling that they're underpaid. Seeing spoiled actors demanding more and more makes this relevant now, I think. I mean, do you think are, are stump people underpaid in the industry? Are they are they paid what they're worth generally? Um, How's that I, been? Have you, have you seen it increase over the years? I mean, you've been in this industry a long time. No, it's decreased over the years. It hasn't decreased. increased. Yeah, if you took the amount of money you made in the 80s on right. residuals and and all of that and and did it in today's money, we're yeah. way behind. And now you know, would just, you would, would so, you say so, sorry, go on. The basic pay is what the actors get for a daily, you know, mm -hmm. just a, a, the bottom of the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so daily or weekly, we're on the same um thing is that as the rank and file actor right and okay. then we get paid stunt adjustments for what we do difficulty wise and danger wise yeah because so, my, my impression was certainly in the 70s and 80s people were always paid for specific stunts and of course the more experienced you were uh going up in that that world the more you could request as your fee for that specific stunt and then of course if you were coordinating you're on a different fee um again um yeah it's you know maybe if you're one of the top guys but <clears throat> yeah you know women never really were paid as much as the guys mm. um and women have to do things in less clothes and less pads. <laughs> yeah. No. In, so, in, and then, in, and then I used to say a lot that, um, you know, it was really important that every job that I went on, I did my very best and, you know, uh, didn't make a mistake because sure. when the guys would crash the cars by accident, they go, Oh, just get me a new one. Or, you know, the coordinator would just say, Oh, just get another one. 
if a woman crashed a car, she was taken out of the seat and a guy yeah. was put in. Right, right. And, okay. and it doesn't matter, you know, experience wise, if it was a guy with less experience and he crashed the car, they'd still give him another chance. Does that, does that still happen now or is, is it more of a lev level playing field? Um, it's a lot better now, but, right. um, you know, when, when you're dealing with motor vehicles, uh, whether it's a car, a motorcycle, a truck, anything that's moving at speed, it can turn into a lethal weapon uh, very quickly mm, if, yeah. if you don't know what you're doing. No, so, no. And with all these cars that try to outthink you and start making decisions for you, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult. Mm. But, um, you know, yeah, they're, they're putting women in and allowing women to do more and more. Um, what are your thoughts on, um, I mean, because, of course, at the minute, most of the industry is on strike right now. And yeah. uh, I don't want to get into that as, as a whole can of worms. But, I mean, Melvin has mentioned that scriptwriters are unhappy with studios using AI to edit scripts. I mean, I, as, a, as a writer myself, I, I find that idea absolutely ab abhorrent because, you know, it's only one step away from getting AI to write scripts. And with the quality of some of the, the writing we've been getting pretty recently, I do wonder whether that's been happening already. <laughs> it's quite possible. I, I mean, and we've just talked about rates of pay. So, I mean, would it be fair to say overall you kind of endorse the strikes? Is that is that a fair comment? I think we should have gone on strike 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. I think but, that, yeah. you know, I, 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 we really didn't have much of a choice, I don't think, mm. because, you know, when it comes to the actors, some people a lot of times work more than the actors do because you're not stuck in a role. You're not being held um, while something's approaching. So we can work on a lot of different things. You can go and do monster truck rallies and things still and that kind of stuff, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, we can also work on a lot of different shows. So like one day I'll be on cool. a feature, one day I'll be on a television show right. and bounce back and forth. Um, actors, the rank and file actor has it, the character actor has it really bad now because right. production only wants to pay them minimum. Hmm. And, you know, they had all kinds of deals that they were getting on a regular basis that now they're just getting the bare minimum. And um, they've taken away more and more and more of our, the way we make a living. Uh, yeah, but you don't see the producers taking a pay cut though, do you? No. Really? I mean, mm -hmm. I know because I've seen the spreadsheets of budgets and, uh, you know, I, yeah. I, so I, I, well, I, that and the the main actors, they're getting more and more and more. And I don't think they yeah. understand. I honestly have to believe that a lot of them would care if they knew what was happening. But yeah. they keep them so insulated through their managers and their agents and their PR people and uh, their security people and all that, that they... Yeah. They really don't know what's going on. I think that some of them, if they knew, they would kick in an extra million for the crew. Yeah, I mean, I, there's that whole thing of living in a bubble, but it, it's nice mm -hmm. to, to see actors like Kevin Bacon has been out on the front line. And um, again, I, I never hit any bad words about him. He's right at the top of the list of people I'd like to work with. So it's nice to see he's out there and, but yeah, I mean, people getting paid ten to twenty million dollars a film is a ridiculous sum of money. And the problem is, what I've found from my humble perch is that you look at the budgets now, and and the mid-budget film, because of those fees being pushed up, has disappeared. Mm -hmm. You basically have the small indies that are made for ridiculous amounts of money, um, anything from fifty to you know, a million, 50,000 to a million. And th th those kinds of films are being churned out over here all the time. And there's not a lot you can do with that money. You can be clever, but, you know, you can't make a Fast and Furious movie with it. And then, you know, then you have the extreme other end of that where things are two, three hundred, four hundred 
million and there's been so many massive failures on that scale i don't think it's sustainable i think i i mean i don't want to get too political on you but i think the whole industry needs to step back and really reevaluate its structure and and if 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 a revaluation comes out of the strikes and that results in better pay for everybody at different levels that can only be a good thing in, in yeah life. that's what we're all hoping for yeah and and it i mean professionals do bring a lot to the table like when i go on set i'm one to two takes max right so how much does it cost in production time to get somebody new who really doesn't know what they're doing yeah they don't really get the shot they want and then it takes them 10 times as long if if not more especially when you're talking about vehicles that you have to get back to number one and cool. you're in a city or, you know, there's. <clears throat> yeah. Well, look, um, uh, Debbie, we've been on for nearly two and a half hours. I don't want to go full David McGiffet on you and keep you here for another half an hour. Um, this has been well, absolutely. Absolutely. If you want, you can do part two. So I, I was just about to say, I would, <laughs> I would love to have you back again. Okay. Um, I actually want to do a show uh, where we specifically talk about favorite action scenes in movies, um, like, you know, top five action sequences of all time, this kind of thing. Uh, it would be great to have you on as a guest for that. Uh, okay. Because I'm sure y you've got your, your own list of favorites, but we could quite happily do a, a, a Debbie Evans part two. Um, I've had people watching the whole way through the stream, which has been great. Uh, people dipping in and out, but uh, there's loads of people I know that are, are, are planning on watching this. Um, running this um, channel means an awful lot to me, um, and it, it's been really good for me actually. So, um, but it wouldn't be uh, as special if uh, guests such as yourself, uh, with the reputations that you have, uh, didn't willingly give up your time uh, to come and talk to me. Uh, for nothing but my thanks. Uh, so I give you my thanks um, on the stream because uh, I, I am very, very grateful for your time because I know as we get older, time is the most precious commodity that we have. So I do not uh, underestimate what that means. We've already got a couple of my... Part two, awesome. Part two is a good <laughs> idea, yes, because I think everybody's <laughs> probably been trawling through your credits on IMDb and going, why hasn't Lance asked about this? <laughs> um, trust me, my list was massive, but we we barely scraped it. I I, I don't want to keep Debbie here uh, any any longer than is necessary. Uh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, David oh, said sure. you're mad, no bad, and wonderful. Um, <laughs> less of the mad, David. Um, I think the stump people go. I you know what know. mad is in 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 British. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, indeed. It means all... good. It's kind of like in, on the East Coast where they say wicked bad. That means really good. I think I think that's where they're going with that. Um, <laughs> well, look, it's been really great. Is there anything final you want to say to kind of wrap up? Uh, any, any other any any final comments? Just that I'm really thankful for the career that I've had and that I still have, and you know, I'm really happy to be doing what I do, and um, I hope that what I've done has added to films not taken away because one of the main things that's really important to me is to have it seamless where the audience isn't taken out of the moment by saying oh there's a stunt no sure you know and that's that's really important and uh you know i i hope i'll be working for many more years i love it i love the adventure i love the travel and going to meet different people and different places and seeing what's alike what's different and um i love picking apart a stunt because there's been things that i've done where i think they're kidding me that they want me to do this <laughs> i say you're kidding right no because i i had to do this one thing on a bridge in quebec and it was freezing cold i had to come down I was doubling Angelina Jolie on Taking Lives, and I had to come down, and they wanted me to throw a 90 between two K-rails, which are the 
the cement barriers. Yeah, the safety. Yeah, and I only <laughs> had like this much room on the front end and that much room on the back end. So um, I honestly thought they were kidding me. And so I'm looking at it and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this and everything. And uh, when I did it, I did it every time. And I don't know how I did it every time. But that, that, that kind of stuff is just really rewarding. Yeah. This, this this is the bridge, right? Yep, that's the bridge. I told and you I was good at getting those shots. <laughs> that, yeah. That's the bridge. That's that, my car right there on fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. But, I, you know, it's all about, you know, the the challenge of, being presented with something and then having to figure it out and taking all of what you've done in the past into consideration um, in formulating your plan for the, for the future, for what's going to happen next. Yeah. And so it's kind of like a puzzle, you know, you try and figure it out and see what's going to work best. And if I do a little of this or a little of that, yeah. Um, reading the terrain, it's it's all like a really fun game for me. Yeah, one final question. I, I know you mentioned you've you've got three children and grandchildren, of course. Have any of them followed you into the business? Um, uh, well, my middle son Daniel is Daniel Levitt. He's a stunt man, and he's doing really good. We got to work together in Portugal last wow. summer. Yeah. So he's he's really good. I mean, he's been on the trampoline since he was a little tyke and has great air awareness and can do a stand he's six one and can do a standing back back I mean, when you when you um when you worked uh, together in, in, in Portugal, was that uh, did you do a stunt together? How did that we were, did we that? were driving vehicles. You were driving you were driving vehicles together. Yeah. Is that Levitt? He, he, is that Levitt with two T's? L E A V I T T. Oh, L E L E A. Uh huh. V I T T. Oh, I've got him. He was he worked on Ford versus Ferrari. Yep. Ah, oh, okay. Yep. This is your this is your boy right here. Yeah, yeah. Just, just got a picture of him. So up. proud of him, and it's so fun when we get to work together. And that was even more fun because on our days off, we rented motorcycles and went riding. <laughs> I know I'm going to have lady friends of mine ask me if he's single, uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, now, now I've put his dreamy-eyed picture up. So, yeah, he's uh, got the bluest eyes. <laughs> so there we go, uh, everyone. Um, not only uh, has Debbie done all these amazing films, but her son was also on Ford versus Ferrari, which is a great movie, incidentally. Well, okay, that's a great place to to wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Do post this places because this has been a fantastic interview. I know loads of people are going to find it very interesting. Um, we covered an amazing amount in two and a half hours. I said the time would fly by. Debbie, thanks for staying well beyond uh, the allotted time. Oh, no uh, worries. I'm, I, I'm used to it. When I people come out here for an interview, they say, oh, we just need 45 minutes. And I'm going, they're going to be here all day. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, I'm glad you didn't have to go anywhere, but um, no, I mean, look, I, I'm just a little, you know, YouTube channel, but uh, as I, I do work in the industry as well, and it, I, I love getting uh, guests on like yourself, and it, it's it's Thank you. very interesting for me to hear how these things are done, and and also ask those kind of more technical onset type questions. So definitely look forward to having you back on again, uh, everybody that's been watching. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. I'm back on my Lone Wolf stream uh, tomorrow night, which, of course, is very different from this. Um, and then uh, we've got our top five. We're doing a top five horror movie um, uh, stream, but only including films from 1970 to 1990. So that's all the kind of like the John Carpenter era and, you know, The Exorcist. And, and I've been trying to get my short list of five films, Debbie. And let me tell you, it is not easy. I've got a short list of oh, like um, 20 uh, movies. 20 movies. Friday the 13th, part five. Were you in that? Yeah, I I had a chainsaw. I was fighting, fighting uh, 
Well, funnily enough, time? that's not on my list, funnily enough. But uh, <laughs> uh, in, uh, in fact, none of the Friday 13th movies are on my my list because they were never my my favorite horror films but there's a couple i don't of... like any of them i'm i'm a, a big chicken <laughs> i've got a couple of john carpenters on there but we'll we'll come back to that all right so guys thanks so much for watching i'll catch you on the other streams i've got more interviews like this coming up soon uh don't want to say who at the minute but there's a couple of people i'm i'm just waiting to hear back from debbie thanks so much again uh for being on the channel and don't forget people that are watching uh, what I've said before, uh, if you haven't called a friend of yours uh, that you've been out of touch for in a while, pick up the phone and give them a ring. None of this uh, text nonsense. Um, you know, people that you haven't been in touch with, trust me, they like getting a phone call. OK, so always, uh, always give your friends that you haven't heard from in a while a ring, especially if you think they're going through a tough time. Josh, thank you for putting up the link to my latest novel. That was very kind. Uh, and that's 1988, and it's out on Amazon now. So if you want to read my diary from 1988, which is incredibly embarrassing at my expense, please feel free to purchase that off of Amazon. And uh, uh, I will see you all again tomorrow night. I think I'm on at 11 o'clock, uh, but I'll double-check that and get back to you. In the meantime, take care out there, and don't forget to tell the people that you love them that you care. And we are 